Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives. Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the world's great detectives of fiction and invites you to listen to the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, Madame Rosica's story in The Scrap of Lace. Good evening, Madame Story. Your being at Murder Clinic is certainly a novelty. You're surprised to see a woman detective, Mr. Knight? That's right. And even more surprised to see a very beautiful detective. <laughs> <laughs> it's a queer business for a woman. <laughs> Most people think so, Mr. Knight. But you see, being a woman gives me one great advantage. My adversaries usually underestimate me. Yes, I suppose they would. <laughs> now, what's the tale you're going to tell us, Madam Story? It's called The Scrap of Lace. I chose it because it seems to me so unusual a crime. A strange story of jealousy and death. Of course you know the great family of Kruger who ruled New York society for generations. When Mrs. Peter John Kruger III died, her mantle descended as a matter of course to Mrs. Peter John Kruger IV. This beautiful and charming young woman, Mimi by name, inherited not only her mother-in-law's scepter, but also Teresa de Guion. Teresa de Guion was the first and certainly the greatest of social secretaries. The story begins one summer morning at Carris Woods, the enormous and rather monstrous Kruger estate in Upper Westchester. Mimi and Teresa de Guion were together in the breakfast room. Oh, Teresa, must we go to that dull dinner at the Bransoms tonight? I think I'll call it off. Mimi, you simply can't do that. Hmm? The dinner's been given for you. Hmm. I was most insistent that I be consulted about the other guests. After all, my dear, you have certain responsibilities. Your mother-in-law, Mrs. Kruger the third. Yes, but... I know. She was a paragon of the social virtues. She didn't mind being bored to death. Oh, Mimi, you are so lax. What would you do without me? <laughs> oh, uh, you worry too much, Teresa. You're living in the past. Your little assistant, Louise Mayfield, could possibly take over very well. Louise? Louise Mayfield? That, that, that child. My dear Teresa, she's 21 and very competent. After all, you trained her. Yes, and I am very fond of Louise. She's like a daughter to me. But take my place? Why, surely you're joking, my dear. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You know, Mimi, I'm a bit worried about Louise. She's been acting very odd lately. This party she's going to tonight, I have no idea where it is or who her hostess is to be. Well, wherever it is, she'll have a better time than I will. You know, Teresa, I shouldn't be surprised if Louise has been acting strangely because she's trying to keep away from my handsome cousin, Jack Rowcliffe. She doesn't seem very grateful to you, Teresa, for arranging to marry him off to Vera McPeak. Jack Rowcliffe and Vera McPeak are a splendid match. He has family, position. Vera is young. She can be molded. She can be taught. Oh, oh, certainly, yes. And her father has 100 millions. But I don't blame Jack for straying from the fold. Louise is very lovely. And I found Vera a very trying guest. In fact, I find it all very trying. Mr. Guillaume. Oh, there's Louise. Uh, Louise, we're in the breakfast room. Uh, come in here, my dear. Good morning, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. De Guion, did you want me this morning? Uh, no, Louise, I did. Teresa insists we go to this dinner tonight. Uh, Jack and Vera are going with us. We'll be leaving around seven. Uh, tell Jack, won't you? Must I, Mrs. Kruger? Mrs. Kruger has asked you to deliver a message. Do so, my dear. <laughs> Jack, I came only to tell you about the dinner. Oh, Louise. Please, must we go through all this again? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm mad about you, Louise. Can't you understand? I'm in love with you. I want you to marry me. You? <laughs> marry and support a wife? Don't be silly, Jack. It does sound silly, doesn't it? But I'm changed, I tell you. You've changed me, Louise. I love you. There's, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And what about Vera McPeak? Oh. No, Jack. I'm afraid you've been bought, paid for, and delivered. Vera won't let you go so easily. I'll tell her tonight that I'm through, Louise. 
I'll meet her at the dinner and tell her, and then I'll come back here to you. Come back if you like, Jack. Good, I'll be back at about... But I won't be here. Where are you going, Louise? Why don't you tell me? It's not a man. I know it's not a man. Who is it? Who is it? Nonsense has gone far enough. What I do is my own business. Do you understand that, Jack? No, it's my business. You're mine, Louise. Do you hear? You're mine. I'll have you or no one else will. Jack, let go my wrist. Louise, tell me. You're hurting me. Please. Louise, I want to know. Let me go. Well, Jack. Vera. You're making passes at the servants, I see. Well, perhaps it's just as well you saw. You might as well have this out now. Shut up. I can handle this. It's pretty easy to see what Miss Mayfield's little game is. She thinks she'll marry into the great Kruger clan. Well, <laughs> let me tell you, Miss Mayfield. Jack hasn't got a cent to his name and never will have. Vera, please. I understand perfectly, Miss McPeak. I assure you, I have no ambitions in Mr. Roker's direction. Quite the lady, aren't you, Miss Mayfield? Well, watch your step. Sure, I know what you all think of me. Vulgar. Common. <laughs> but let me tell you, we common clay McPeaks from Pittsburgh know how to get what we want. And we know how to keep it. Think that over, Miss Mayfield. Think that over. <laughs> Yes, come in. Mademoiselle, Miss Louise. Madam Kruger has sent me to help you dress for your engagement. Oh, come in, look. How thoughtful of Mrs. Kruger to send you, Suzanne. Have they gone? But we, oui, the car she left long ago. Oh, and you say we're not happy. Monsieur Jacques? He say nothing. And Mademoiselle, his fiancée, the ugly one, she... <laughs> oh, you say, she's very angry. Even Madame, she wants not to go. Well, let's not think of them, Suzanne. I'm happy, and I'm going to have a wonderful time. Now, Mademoiselle is très charmante. Very lovely. It is a tryst you go to, n'est-ce pas? It is for your young man that your eyes shine so. Hmm? <laughs> Maybe. You're too smart, Suzanne. But how do you think my young man will like me? How do I look? Oh, ravissant, Mademoiselle. You'll eat you up. You are so lovely. Suzanne, you are a darling. Yes, yes. A letter for Miss Mayfield. Oh, thanks. It is a letter for you, mademoiselle. For me? Well, it's a thick one, isn't it? Oh, how lovely. What an exquisite handkerchief. Why, who could have sent it to me? Madame Kruger must have sent it. It is one of the six she bought in Paris. It is perfect, mademoiselle, for your costume, n'est-ce pas? Oh, it's lovely. What a darling Mrs. Kruger is. She is most generous. You will carry this, no? Of course. Shall I put the scent, the perfume, on it, mademoiselle? No, thank you. I'll do it myself, Suzanne. Oh, just put that bottle of gardenia perfume on my dressing table, please. Oui, mademoiselle. Now you can go, Suzanne. I won't need you anymore. Merci, mademoiselle. Bon revoir, mademoiselle. Good night, Suzanne, and thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's so lovely. One more drop. <sighs> Suzanne, Suzanne, help! Suzanne, help! John, John. my years of experience, Mimi, I have never had to cope with anything so, so sordid. Teresa, how, how can you think of appearances with Louise, that beautiful child, lying I... in there dead? But I must think of them. After all, Dr. Plummer refuses to sign a death certificate. <laughs> that old fossil with his hints of foul play. Well, maybe he's right, Vera. Maybe what do you a... mean, Jack? What do you know of Louise Mayfield's death? Well, I... Stop wrangling, you two. Dr. Plummer was kind enough to give us 36 hours. He's risking a great deal going as far as that. Oh, why doesn't Madame Story get here? Are you sure you acted wisely in calling her in, Mimi? Well, it was either she or the police. 
You said she had a reputation for discretion. Come in. Yes? Madam Rosica Story and Miss Bella Brickley. Thank heaven you're here, Madam Story. This is a terrible situation. Terrible. Oh, but let me introduce you. I am Teresa de Guillaume. This is Mrs. Peter John Kruger III. How do you How do? You do? do? Miss McPeak. Hello. Miss McPeak. Mr. Rokeliff. How do you How do, 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 Mr. Rokeliff? It was good of you to come so quickly, Madam Story. This unfortunate accident is likely to create a dress dressing scandal for Mrs. Kruger. Accident, Mr. Guillon? From what you told me over the phone, I gathered Louise Mayfield had been murdered. Nonsense. We don't know that, Madam Story. Nobody does. We only know Louise is dead. Poor child. We found her when we returned last night from our dinner party. It is nonsense, Teresa, and you know it. Madam Story is perfectly right. It would be very foolish to ask her help and not, not give her all the facts. What facts, Mimi? Just because that old fossil of a Dr. Plummer won't give a death certificate. If you ask me, it's a nice little scheme to get you to hire this story woman and split whatever she can manage to get out of you. Vera. That's an interesting idea, Miss McPeak, though I must confess that so simple and clever a scheme would never have occurred to me. But surely Dr. Plummer offered some other reason for refusing a death certificate? Yes. He says... Oh, well, it's impossible, but he says Louise was asphyxiated. No, old fool, there isn't a gas outlet in the house. How helpful of you to know that, Miss McPeak. You won't mind, will you, if I check for myself? No, I don't mind what you do. Oh, what's the use of all this? We've nothing to tell. All of us were at a dinner party 20 miles from here together. When we got home after 11, we found Louise, well, that is, Miss Mayfield, dead. I see. Mr. Guillon, when you phoned me, you said something about some missing object. Yes. Suzanne, the maid, insists a lace handkerchief came in the mail for Louise as she was dressing to leave. When we found her, the handkerchief had disappeared. Very interesting. Suppose I start, then, by questioning this maid, Suzanne. Maybe she can tell me more about this missing handkerchief. Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Madam Story. Typing last night's notes, I see. Yes. Say, you look worried. What is it? Oh, how can one look out at that peaceful garden and realize that in this house there's someone carrying the mark of Cain on their soul? Then you believe Louise Mayfield's death was not a natural one? That she was murdered? No doubt of it. Bella, that girl was asphyxiated. Oh, how horrible. So young and so full of life. Yes, isn't it? And it's our job to find out who killed her. Have you finished typing those notes you took at our interminable interviews last night? Not quite. I'm almost finished. Well, then I think I'll step out in the terrace. Maybe the fresh air will help me think. Something is bothering you. Yes, Bella. What happened to that lace handkerchief Louise Mayfield received in the mail? I'm sure that was the thing that killed her. I must find it. Will you call, will you call me when you're through with those notes, please? <laughs> Madam Story, you come out and shame the flowers and dim the sunlight. Do you always make such pretty speeches, even so early in the morning, Mr. Rokeliff? Ah, oh, beautiful lady, you remember my name. Yours would be a difficult name to forget, Mr. Rokeliff. Hmm? Thanks to the Rotical View and the Picture Magazine. Oh, that. You know, I had no hope of ever meeting you. I can't aspire to your circle. Much too clever. Hmm, it all depends. I should say that you were quite clever enough. For your own purposes, Mr. Rokeliff. <laughs> I'm just a lightweight. <laughs> oh, I wonder. I see you're standing out under her window. That is Miss Mayfield's room up there, isn't it? Yes. Well, that was her room. Ivy-clad walls, old English ivy. Sturdy and strong, too. I wonder why the vines are so torn and broken. Oh, are they? I, I hadn't noticed. You loved Louise Mayfield very much, didn't you? Yes, I loved him more than anything in life. And she? Oh, why should she care for me? What am I? Nothing but a wastrel. She was in love with someone else. I know it. I could tell. But if I'd known who it was, I... Why didn't you tell me, Mr. Rokeliff? You'd left your dinner party and came back here last night. 
How did you know that I did? I didn't. You've just told me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> well, there, you see, I, I told you you're too clever for me. What time was it when you got here? Well, I don't, don't know. It was about 9.30, I think. I see. You came around back here in the garden. You saw a light in her window. You called her. Got no answer. And you climbed that ivy up to her window, didn't you? Well, I... Who saw me? Nobody, as far as I know. That broken ivy tells its own story. But not all of it. Tell me, what did you do when you got up there? I suppose you're thinking that I killed her. I wouldn't blame you if you did. I don't care much if you do. I've got nothing oh, please, more... Please, please, Mr. Rooker. I'm sorry. Well, I... I went in and... found her lying there on the floor, dead... Then, like the coward I am, I got scared. How could I explain my being there? So I climbed down again the way I went up and drove back to Quaker Ridge. I suppose you don't believe me. Suppose I say I reserve judgment. Now, will you give me the handkerchief that you took from Louise Mayfield's hand? And you're a wizard. How did you know that? It's obvious. I suppose that you took it as a remembrance of her. Yes, I, I did. It was the last thing she had touched. Here it is. Madam Thank Story, you. Madam Story, could you come into the office a moment? Certainly, Bella. We'll continue this talk later, Mr. Rowcliffe. Will you excuse me now, please? Sure. So this letter was pushed under the door. Did you open it, Bella? No, I saw it was addressed to Louise Mayfield, so I called you. I see. Hmm, it's postmark Briarcliffe. Here's a notation on the envelope in pencil. <laughs> I'm a very literate correspondent, Bella. <laughs> if you want to buy any more info about this letter, we can make a deal. I'll drop around at 11. Well, we haven't long to wait. Now, let's read the letter. Darling, I can hardly wait till Tuesday night when I'll see you again. I'm moving heaven and earth to arrange things so we'll be together for always. All my love, dear... It's signed J. J? That must be Jack Rowcliffe. In the light of what we know of their relationship, does it sound like Jack Rowcliffe? No, that's stupid of me. But the initial. Mm, it could be the J stands for John, Peter... Peter John Kruger. Uh-huh. This must be our mysterious correspondent now. Come in. Well, ladies. There I am. Johnny on the spot, like I says. No way to business. You're the Kruger chauffeur, aren't you, Mr. Rowe? Uh... Gargan's the name. Chauffeur and bodyguard. I'm sure you're efficient in both departments, Mr. Gargan. But uh, why the bodyguard? Well, it's like this. The Krugers are important people, see? Mm-hmm. They're likely to be bothered by cranks and other undesirable citizens, get it? They need protection. And I'm the guy that can protect them. Yes, I can see that, Gargan. But now, um, about this letter. Yeah, that's right. Well, do I sing or don't I? That depends on your song, Gargan. First, tell me. How did you manage to get hold of this letter? Well, it's like this. I always get the mail, see? And I always deliver it. But yesterday, Mrs. Kruger and the old dame are with me. I go in and get the mail, and I look through it to see if there's something for me. And I see this letter. Well, when I come out to the car, Mrs. Kruger says, give me the mail. I hand it to her. And when I get it back, this letter ain't with the others. Well, I don't think much about it till last night when his Mayfield dame has bumped off. Then I begin to smell a rat. And this morning, I did a little mooching around. And here it is. Very graphic, Gargan. How's that? Oh, skip it. Now, uh, what further information have you to give us, Gargan? I can tell you who sent that letter to the Mayfield dame. So? For how much? Half a G. Five hundred dollars? That's an expensive song, Gargan. Ah, nuts. You can put it on the expense account. You're right. Nuts it is. The $500 is yours. Thanks. Here you are. Now, who sent this letter to Louise Mayfield? Well, it was the one... Oh, Gargan. Madam Story, is he dead? Yes. The shot came through that window. Oh, why? To keep him from telling us who sent that letter to Louise. Help me put him in that closet over there. Frizik, I won't let you. You can't. You've got to report it. If I report it now, the police would interfere with all my plans. I need 24 hours. You're risking your reputation. We've taken risks before. But this is concealing a murder. Why do you need 24 hours? To learn the secret of this, Bella. Why? Why, that's one of Mrs. Kruger's handkerchiefs. No, Bella. It's the handkerchief. The one Rowcliffe found on Louise Mayfield's body. 
I'm staking my reputation on this little scrap of lace. Madam Story, Potter is back. Oh, that's good, Bella. Did he bring back the uh, handkerchief from the laboratory report? Yes, here they are. Hmm, just as I thought. Oh, what a horrible use for such a lovely thing. This handkerchief was the murder weapon, Bella. But how could it have been? Because our murderer knew that Louise Mayfield used gardenia toilet water. But can we find out who sent it? I rather think we can. Bella, get those four lace handkerchiefs that Suzanne got for me from Mrs. Kruger. What are you going to do now? Now, my dear Bella, I'm going out to present a noose to a murderer. <laughs> Mr. Rowcliffe, I wanted to return this handkerchief to you for safekeeping. I'll want it back tomorrow morning. I don't know how at present. But I feel this handkerchief will be the means of proving who killed Louise Mayfield. So, guard it carefully. Well, I'll do that. You can depend on me, Madam Story. Thank you, Mr. Rowcliffe. Miss McPeak, the greatest proof that I'm not against you is that I'm going to ask you to keep this handkerchief for me. The most important piece of evidence I have. I have no assurance the murderer would not kill me to get it back. But it would never be supposed that I'd given it to you to guard. Will you keep it for me until tomorrow morning? No, don't worry. I'll keep it safe. Thank you, Miss McPeak. Mrs. Kruger, what I came to see you... Right. No, it's not. It's the handkerchief. It's the one that was sent to Louise Mayfield. Where'd you get it? Well, I can't tell you that now, but I'm afraid it was the cause of her death. Oh, how horrible. What I'm going to ask you to do is to hold it for me just until tomorrow morning. Gion, you can help. What is the real situation, Madam Story? Oh, I wish I knew. I suspect, but I have no proof. I can go no further without the assistance from the chemists. Whom do you suspect? Oh, you know. I'm afraid I do. Well, what I want you to do is to keep this dreadful handkerchief for me until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Mrs. Kruger, I have asked you, Miss de Guion, Miss McPeak, and Mr. Rowcliffe to meet me here this morning in order that we may determine who murdered Louise Mayfield. Why, what do you mean? You, you, you know, Madam Story? You, you know who killed her? I believe I do, Mrs. Kruger, but I hope to prove it. I know that lace handkerchief was sent to her through the mail was the murder weapon. Perhaps that can tell us something. May I have the handkerchief, please? Why, certainly. Sure, sure, my oh, dear. here you are. Why, I thought... I it... don't understand. Well, I say, what is this? So, a trick. That's right, Miss McPeak, a trick. But one only a guilty person need fear. Guilty? But oh, really, I Madam Story, I don't understand. Yes, yes, Madam Story. Please take the handkerchiefs one at a time. Mark each in pencil with the initials of the person from whom you receive it. Mm. May I have the handkerchiefs, please? Yes, yes, one at a time. Well, yes. all right. Now, Bella... Spread them out on your desk with the initials turned face down. As you probably surmise, none of you had the original handkerchief. That has never left my possession. Here it is. But I don't understand. This handkerchief in my hand is impregnated with a deadly poison. When moistened with alcohol, it releases a lethal gas which is instantly fatal. May I remind you that perfume is 90% alcohol. And a young girl about to go out on a romantic tryst would inevitably moisten it with perfume. How horrible. Yes, Mr. Guion, I agree with but, you. But surely you don't suspect any of us. Why not, Miss McPeak? I found that a murderer is usually actuated by fear. Fear of what the victim might do to them. All of you face that fear as far as Louise Mayfield was concerned. 
but one of you feared so deeply that you dared risk murder to protect what you had. You feared loss of position, prestige, supplanting by a younger, more attractive girl, loss of all that had made life worth living. That one person alone knew what the fatal handkerchief contained. I gave each one of you what you thought was that handkerchief. I was curious to see what disposition you would make of the evidence. Bella. Yes? Please examine those four handkerchiefs carefully. And when you've done that, tell me if any of them are changed since they left our hands last evening. Yes. This one has been washed. Washed? Well, I don't understand. Read the initials on it. T. D. E. G. Teresa. Teresa! Keep away from me. Keep away from me, I say. Keep away from me. I'll shoot. Why? Karen. She shot herself. Oh. It's all my fault. Poor Teresa. Poor thing. She, she was all she... She couldn't stand it. She, she just couldn't stand it. No, Mrs. Kruger. It wasn't your fault. It was better so. The end of a passing world. Exit an era. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Sir Henry Merivale, known to his host of admirers as H.M., in Death in the Dressing Room. This famous detective finds a brilliantly clever pickpocket and discovers an even more clever murderer. Tonight's detective was Madame Rosica's story, played by Elizabeth Morgan. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives, Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the world's great detectives of fiction and invites you to listen to the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, Madame Rosica's story in The Scrap of Lace. Madam Story, your being at Murder Clinic is certainly a novelty. You're surprised to see a woman detective, Mr. Knight? That's right, and even more surprised to see a very beautiful detective. <laughs> <laughs> it's a queer business for a woman. <laughs> Most people think so, Mr. Knight, but you see, being a woman gives me one great advantage. My adversaries usually underestimate me. Yes, I suppose they would. 
Now, what's the tale you're going to tell us, Madam Story? It's called The Scrap of Lace. I chose it because it seems to me so unusual a crime. A strange story of jealousy and death. Of course you know the great family of Kruger who ruled New York society for generations. When Mrs. Peter John Kruger III died, her mantle descended as a matter of course to Mrs. Peter John Kruger IV. This beautiful and charming young woman, Mimi by name, inherited not only her mother-in-law's scepter, but also Teresa de Guion. Teresa de Guion was the first and certainly the greatest of social secretaries. The story begins one summer morning at Carris Woods, the enormous and rather monstrous Kruger estate in Upper Westchester. Mimi and Teresa de Guion were together in the breakfast room. Oh, Teresa, must we go to that dull dinner at the Bransoms tonight? I think I'll call it off. Mimi, you simply can't do that. Hmm? The dinner's being given for you. Hmm. I was most insistent that I be consulted about the other guests. After all, my dear, you have certain responsibilities. Your mother-in-law, Mrs. Kruger III... Yes, I know. She was a paragon of the social virtues. She didn't mind being bored to death. Oh, Mimi, you are so lax. What would you do without me? <laughs> ah, you worry too much, Teresa. You're living in the past. Your little assistant, Louise Mayfield, could possibly take over very well. Louise? Louise Mayfield? That's quite that child. My dear Teresa, she's 21 and very competent. After all, you trained her. Yes, and I am very fond of Louise. She's like a daughter to me. But take my place? Why, surely you're joking, my dear. Oh, yes, yes, of course. You know Mimi. I'm a bit worried about Louise. She's been acting very odd lately. This party she's going to tonight, I have no idea where it is or who her hostess is to be. Well, wherever it is, she'll have a better time than I will. You know, Teresa, I shouldn't be surprised if Louise has been acting strangely because she's trying to keep away from my handsome cousin, Jack Rowcliffe. She doesn't seem very grateful to you, Teresa, for arranging to marry him off to Vera McPeak. Jack Rowcliffe and Vera McPeak are a splendid match. He has family, position. Vera is young. She can be molded. She can be taught. Oh, oh, certainly, yes. And her father has 100 millions. But I don't blame Jack for straying from the fold. Louise is very lovely. And I find Vera a very trying guest. In fact, I find it all very trying. Mr. Guillaume. Oh, there's Louise. Uh, Louise, we're in the breakfast room. Uh, come in here, my dear. Good morning, Mrs. Kruger. Mrs. de Guion, did you want me this morning? Uh, no, Louise, I did. Teresa insists we go to this dinner tonight. Jack and Vera are going with us. We'll be leaving around seven. Uh, tell Jack, won't you? Must I, Mrs. Kruger? Mrs. Kruger has asked you to deliver a message. Do so, my dear. <laughs> Jack, I came only to tell you about the dinner. Oh, Louise. Please, must we go through all this again? Why don't you leave me alone? Because I'm mad about you, Louise. Can't you understand? I'm in love with you. I want you to marry me. You marry and support a wife? Don't be silly, Jack. It does sound silly, doesn't it? But I'm changed, I tell you. You've changed me, Louise. I love you. There's, there's nothing I wouldn't do for you. And what about Vera McPeak? Oh. No, Jack. I'm afraid you've been bought, paid for, and delivered. Vera won't let you go so easily. I'll tell her tonight that I'm through, Louise. I'll meet her at the dinner and tell her, and then I'll come back here to you. Come back if you like, Jack. Good. I'll be back at about... But I won't be here. Where are you going, Louise? Why don't you tell me? It's not a man. I know it's not a man. Who is it? Who is this it? This nonsense has gone far enough. What I do is my own business. Do you understand that, Jack? No, it's my business. You're mine, Louise. Do you hear? You're mine. I'll have you or no one else will. Jack, let go of my wrist. Louise, tell me. You're hurting me. Please. Louise, I want to know. Let me go. Well, Jack, you're making passes at the servants, I see. Perhaps it's just as well you saw. Might as well have this out now. Shut up. I can handle this. It's pretty easy to see what Miss Mayfield's little game is. She thinks she'll marry into the great Kruger clan. Well, let me tell you, Miss Mayfield. Jack hasn't got a cent to his name and never will have. Vera, please. I understand perfectly, Miss McPeak. I assure you, I have no ambitions in Mr. Rokeless' direction. Quite the lady, aren't you, Miss Mayfield? Well, watch your step. 
Sure, I know what you all think of me. Vulgar, common. <laughs> but let me tell you, we common clay McPeaks from Pittsburgh know how to get what we want. And we know how to keep it. Think that over, Miss Mayfield. Think that over. <laughs> Yes, come in. Mademoiselle, please. Madame Kruger has sent me to help you dress for your engagement. Oh, come in, look. How thoughtful of Mrs. Kruger to send you, Suzanne. Have they gone? But we, oui, the car she left long ago. Oh, and you see, we're not happy. Monsieur Jacques? He say nothing. And Mademoiselle, his fiancée, the ugly one, she... <laughs> oh, you see, she's very angry. Even Madame, she wants not to go. Well, let's not think of them, Suzanne. I'm happy, and I'm going to have a wonderful time. Now, mademoiselle is très charmant. Very lovely. It is a thrift you go to, n'est-ce pas? It is for your young man that your eyes shine so. Hmm? <laughs> Maybe. You're too smart, Suzanne. How do I look? Oh, ravissant, mademoiselle. You'll eat you up. You are so lovely. Suzanne, you are a darling. Yes, yes. Who is it? A letter from Miss Mayfield. Oh, thanks. It is a letter for you, mademoiselle. For me? Well, it's a thick one, isn't it? Oh, how lovely. What an exquisite handkerchief. Why, who could have sent it to me? Madame Kruger must have sent it. It is one of the six she bought in Paris. It is perfect, mademoiselle, for your costume, n'est-ce pas? Oh, it's lovely. What a darling Mrs. Kruger is. Oui, she is most generous. Shall I put the scent, the perfume, on it, mademoiselle? No, thank you. I'll do it myself, Suzanne. Oh, just put that bottle of gardenia perfume on my dressing table, please. Oui, mademoiselle. Now you can go, Suzanne. I won't need you anymore. Merci, mademoiselle. Bonne revoir, mademoiselle. Good night, Suzanne, and thank you. Hmm. Oh, it's so lovely. One more drop. Ah. <sighs> my years of experience, Mimi, I have never had to cope with anything so, so sordid. Teresa, how, how can you think of appearances with Louise, that beautiful child, lying I... in there dead? But I must think of them. After all, Dr. Plummer refuses to sign a death certificate. <laughs> that old fossil with his hints of foul play. Well, maybe he's right, Vera. Maybe what do you a... mean, Jack? What do you know of Louise Mayfield's death? Well, I... Stop wrangling, you two. Dr. Plummer was kind enough to give us 36 hours. He's risking a great deal going as far as that. Oh, why doesn't Madame Story get here? Are you sure you acted wisely in calling her in, Mimi? Well, it was either she or the police. You said she had a reputation for discretion. Come in. Yes? Madame Rosica Story and Miss Bella Brickley. Thank heaven you're here, Madame Story. This is a terrible situation, terrible. Oh, but let me introduce you. I am Teresa de Guillon. This is Mrs. Peter John Kruger III. How do, How you, do you do? Miss McPeak. Hello. Miss McPeak. Mr. Roque. How do you How do, do, do? Roque? It was good of you to come so quickly, Madam Story. This unfortunate accident is likely to create a dress dressing scandal for Mrs. Kruger. Accident, Mr. Guillon? From what you told me over the phone, I gathered Louise Mayfield had been murdered. Nonsense. We don't know that, Madam Story. Nobody does. We only know Louise is dead. Poor child. We found her when we returned last night from our dinner party. It is nonsense, Teresa, and you know it. Madame Story is perfectly right. It would be very foolish to ask her help and not, not give her all the facts. What facts, Mimi? Just because that old fossil of a Dr. Plummer won't give a death certificate. If you ask me, it's a nice little scheme to get you to hire this Story woman and split whatever she can manage to get out of you. Sarah, that's an interesting idea, Miss McPeak, though I must confess that so simple and clever a scheme would never have occurred to me. 
But surely Dr. Plummer offered some other reason for refusing a death certificate. Yes. He says... Oh, it's impossible, but... He says Louise was... Asphyxiated. No, fool, there isn't a gas outlet in the house. How helpful of you to know that, Miss McPeak. You won't mind, will you, if I check for myself? No, I don't mind what you do. Oh, what's the use of all this? We've nothing to tell. All of us were at a dinner party 20 miles from here together. When we got home after 11, we found Louise... Well, that is, Miss Mayfield, dead. I see. Mr. Guion, when you phoned me, you said something about some missing object. Suzanne, the maid, insists a lace handkerchief came in the mail for Louise as she was dressing to leave. When we found her, the handkerchief had disappeared. Very interesting. Suppose I start, then, by questioning this maid, Suzanne. Maybe she can tell me more about this missing handkerchief. Good morning, Bella. Good morning, Madam Story. Typing last night's notes, I see. Yes. Say, you look worried. What is it? Oh, how can one look out at that peaceful garden and realize that in this house there's someone carrying the mark of Cain on their soul? And you believe Louise Mayfield's death was not a natural one? That she was murdered? No doubt of it. Bella, that girl was asphyxiated. Oh, how horrible. So young and so full of life. And it's our job to find out who killed her. Have you finished typing those notes you took at our interminable interviews last night? Not quite. I'm almost finished. Well, then I think I'll step out in the terrace. Maybe the fresh air will help me think. Something is bothering you. Yes, Bella. What happened to that lace handkerchief Louise Mayfield received in the mail? I'm sure that was the thing that killed her. I must find it. Do call me when you're through with those notes, please. <laughs> Madam Story, you come out and shame the flowers and dim the sunlight. Do you always make such pretty speeches, even so early in the morning, Mr. Rokeley? Oh, beautiful lady, you remember my name. Yours would be a difficult name to forget, Mr. Rokeley. Hmm? Thanks to the Rotary Review and the picture magazine. Oh, that. You know, I had no hope of ever meeting you. I can't aspire to your circle. Much too clever. Hmm, it all depends. I should say that you were quite clever enough. For your own purposes, Mr. Rokeley. <laughs> I'm just a lightweight. <laughs> I wonder. I see you're standing out under her window. That is Miss Mayfield's room up there, isn't it? Yes. Well, that was her room. Ivy-clad walls, old English ivy. Dirty and strong, too. I wonder why the vines are so torn and broken. Oh, are they? I, I hadn't noticed. You loved Louise Mayfield very much, didn't you? Yes, I loved him more than anything in life. And she? Oh, why should she care for me? What am I? Nothing but a wastrel. She was in love with someone else. I know it. I could tell. But if I'd known who it was, I... Why didn't you tell me, Mr. Rocliffe? You'd left your dinner party and came back here last night. How did you know that I did? I didn't. You've just told me. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> well, there, you see, I, I told you you're too clever for me. What time was it when you got here? Well, I don't, don't know. It was about 9.30, I think. I see. You came around back here in the garden. You saw a light in her window, called her, got no answer. And you climbed that ivy up to her window, didn't you? Well, I... who saw me? Nobody, as far as I know. That broken ivy tells its own story, but not all of it. Tell me, what did you do when you got up there? I suppose you're thinking that I killed her. I wouldn't blame you if you did. I don't care much if you do. I've got nothing more... Please, please, Mr. Oakley. I'm sorry. Well, I... I went in and found her lying there on the floor, dead. Then, like the coward I am, I got scared. How could I explain my being there? So I climbed down again the way I went up and drove back to Quaker Ridge. I suppose you don't believe me. Suppose I say I reserve judgment. No... Will you give me the handkerchief that you took from Louise Mayfield's hand? How did you know that? It's obvious. I suppose that you took it as a remembrance of her. Yes, I, I did. It was the last thing she had touched. Here it is. Madam Story, 
Madam Story, could you come into the office a moment? We'll continue this talk later, Mr. Rowcliffe. Will you excuse me now, please? So this letter was pushed under the door. Did you open it, Bella? No. I saw it was addressed to Louise Mayfield, so I called you. I see. Hmm, it's postmarked Briarcliff. Here's a notation on the envelope in pencil. <laughs> Not a very literate correspondent, Bella. <laughs> If you want to buy any more info about this letter, we can make a deal. I'll drop around at 11. Well, we have long to wait. Now, let's read the letter. Darling, I can hardly wait till Tuesday night when I'll see you again. I'm moving heaven and earth to arrange things so we'll be together for always. All my love, dear. It's signed J. J? That must be Jack Rowcliffe. In the light of what we know of their relationship, does it sound like Jack Roker? No, that's stupid of me. But the initial. It could be the J stands for John. Peter, Peter John Kruger. Uh -huh. This must be our mysterious correspondent now. Come in. Well, ladies, there I am. Johnny on the spot, like I says. Do we do business? You're the Kruger chauffeur, aren't you, Mr. Rugg? Gargan's the name. Chauffeur and bodyguard. I'm sure you're efficient in both departments, Mr. Gargan. But uh, why the bodyguard? Well, it's like this. The Krugers are important people, see? Mm -hmm. They're likely to be bothered by cranks and other undesirable citizens, get it? They need protection. And I'm the guy that can protect them. Yes, I can see that, Gargan. But now, um, about this letter. Yeah, that's right. Well, do I sing or don't I? That depends on your song, Gargan. First, tell me, how did you manage to get hold of this letter? Well, it's like this. I always get the mail, see? And I always deliver it. But yesterday, Mrs. Kruger and the old dame are with me. I go in and get the mail, and I look through it to see if there's something for me. And I see this letter. Well, when I come out to the car, Mrs. Kruger says, give me the mail. I hands it to her. And when I get it back, this letter ain't with the others. Well, I don't think much about it till last night when this Mayfield dame has bumped off. Then I begin to smell a rat. And this morning, I does a little mooching around. And here it is. Very graphic, Gargan. How's that? Oh, skip it. Now, uh, what further information have you to give us, Gargan? I can tell you who sent that letter to the Mayfield dame. So? For how much? Half a G. Five hundred dollars? That's an expensive song, Gargan. Ah, nuts. You can put it on the expense account. You're right. Nuts it is. The five hundred dollars is yours. Thanks. Here you are. Now, who sent this letter to Louise Mayfield? Well, it was the one... <laughs> Oh, goodness. Madam Story, is he dead? Yes. The shot came through that window. Oh, why? To keep him from telling us who sent that letter to Louise. Help me put him in that closet over there. Rizik, I won't let you. You can't. You've got to report it. If I report it now, the police would interfere with all my plans. I need 24 hours. You're risking your reputation. We've taken risks before. But this is concealing a murder. Why do you need 24 hours? To learn the secret of this, Bella. Why? Why, that's one of Mrs. Kruger's handkerchiefs. No, Bella. It's the handkerchief. The one Rokliff found on Louise Mayfield's body. I'm staking my reputation on this little scrap of lace. Madam Story, Potter is back. Oh, that's good, Bella. Did he bring back the uh, handkerchief from the laboratory report? Yes, here they are. Hmm, just as I thought. Oh, what a horrible use for such a lovely thing. This handkerchief was the murder weapon, Bella. But how could it have been? Because our murderer knew that Louise Mayfield used gardenia toilet water. But can we find out who sent it? I rather think we can. Bella, get those four lace handkerchiefs that Suzanne got for me from Mrs. Kruger. What are you going to do now? Now, my dear Bella, I'm going out to present a noose to a murderer. <laughs> Mr. Rowcliffe, I wanted to return this handkerchief to you for safekeeping. I'll want it back tomorrow morning. I don't know how at present. But I feel this handkerchief will be the means of proving who killed Louise Mayfield. So guard it carefully. Well, I'll do that. You can depend on me, Madam Story. Thank you, Mr. Rowcliffe. Miss McPeak, the greatest proof that I'm not against you is that I'm going to ask you to keep this handkerchief for me. The most important piece of evidence I have. 
I have no assurance the murderer would not kill me to get it back. But it would never be supposed that I'd given it to you to guard. Will you keep it for me until tomorrow morning? No, don't worry. I'll keep it safe. Thank you, Miss McPeak. Mrs. Kruger, it's the handkerchief. It's the one that was sent to Louise Mayfield. Where'd you get it? Can't tell you that now, but I'm afraid it was the cause of her death. Oh, how horrible. What I'm going to ask you to do is to hold it for me just until tomorrow morning. But, Mr. Guion, you can help. What is the real situation, Madam Story? Oh, I wish I knew. I suspect, but I have no proof. I can go no further without the assistance from the chemist. Whom do you suspect? Oh, you know. I'm afraid I do. Well, what I want you to do is to keep this for me until tomorrow morning. <laughs> Mrs. Kruger, I have asked you, Miss de Guion, Miss McPeak, and Mr. Rowcliffe to meet me here this morning in order that we may determine who murdered Louise Mayfield. Why, what do you mean? You, you know, Madam Story? You, you know who killed her? I believe I do, Mrs. Kruger, but I hope to prove it. I know that lace handkerchief was sent to her through the mail was the murder weapon. Perhaps that can tell us something. May I have the handkerchief, please? Why, certainly. Yeah, sure, my Oh, dear. here you are. Why, I thought I that... I don't understand. I say, what is this? So, a trick. That's right, Miss McPeak, a trick. But one only a guilty person need fear. Guilty. But oh, really, I Madam Story, I don't Bella. understand. Yes, Madam Story. Please take the handkerchiefs one at a time. Mark each in pencil with the initials of the person from whom you receive it. May I have the handkerchiefs, please? Yes, yes, ma'am. One at a time. Well, all right. Now, Bella, spread them out on your desk with the initials turned face down. As you probably surmise, none of you had the original handkerchief. That has never left my possession. Here it is. But I don't understand. This handkerchief in my hand is impregnated with a deadly poison. When moistened with alcohol, it releases a lethal gas, which is instantly fatal. May I remind you that perfume is 90% alcohol, and a young girl about to go out on a romantic tryst would inevitably moisten it with perfume. How horrible. Yes, Mr. Guillaume. I agree with you. But surely you don't suspect any of us. Why not, Miss McPeak? I've found that a murderer is usually actuated by fear. Fear of what the victim might do to them. All of you faced that fear as far as Louise Mayfield was concerned. But one of you feared so deeply that you dared risk murder to protect what you had. You feared loss of position, prestige, supplanting by a younger, more attractive girl, loss of all that had made life worth living. That one person alone knew what the fatal handkerchief contained. I gave each one of you what you thought was that handkerchief. I was curious to see what disposition you would make of the evidence. Bella. Yes? Please examine those four handkerchiefs carefully. And when you've done that, tell me if any of them are changed since they left our hands last evening. Yes. This one has been washed. Washed? Well, I don't understand. Read the initials on it. T, D, E, G. Teresa. Teresa! Keep away from me. Keep away from me, I say. Keep away from me. I'll shoot. Why do you shoot? Can't. She's shot herself. Oh. It's all my fault. Poor Teresa. Poor thing, she... She was all she... She couldn't stand it. She she just couldn't stand it. No, Mrs. Kruger. It wasn't your fault. It was better so. The end of a passing world. Exit an era. have been listening to Murder Clinic.
Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Sir Henry Merivale, known to his host of admirers as H.M. in Death in the Dressing Room. This famous detective finds a brilliantly clever pickpocket and discovers an even more clever murderer. Tonight's detective was Madame Rosica's story, played by Elizabeth Morgan. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives, Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the world's great detectives of fiction and invites you to listen to the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, we meet Sir Henry Merivale, known to his host of friends as H.M., in the story, Death in the Dressing Room. Good evening, H.M. Tell me, you were with Scotland Yard for a long time before you retired, weren't you? I was indeed, Mr. Knight. And didn't I hear that you ran some sort of a secret department for them? Well, there was nothing secret about it. You see, it was called the Department of Queer Complaints. All the crackpots were sent in to me. Uh, as a matter of fact, that's how I happened to be on the spot when this nightclub murder took place. You see, I was there investigating one of our queer complaints that didn't seem to have anything to do with murder. And, uh, well, suppose I begin at the beginning, eh? You know how sometimes a nightclub will catch the public's fancy, the place to see and be seen at... Well, at the time of this story, the Orient Club in London was having just such a season, flourishing like the proverbial Green Bay tree. Tony Kaplan, who ran it, was a smooth, slippery customer, Piccadilly, by the way, of Times Square and Monte Carlo. And he did have one big drawing card, the star of his show, uh, by the way, another Times Square product, Francine Rapport. She was a great dancer. On the afternoon of the day in question, Tony Kaplan was rehearsing Francine. Francine, what's the matter with you? You're introducing this Javanese temple dance tonight. Come on, quit clowning and get with it, will you? Oh, let's cut it out, Tony. It's too corny. Standing in the middle of the floor, waving your arms around like snakes. That went out with the ark. They'll eat it up. Listen, Francine, since when did you start masterminding your routines? You dance and leave the thinking to me. Oh, yes? Well, maybe I don't like the way you've been thinking lately, Tony. And maybe I don't like the way you've been acting either. Where were you last night after the show? Oh, nuts. Let's not go through that dialogue again. Put on another record. Well, don't get any big ideas under that patent leather hair of yours. I got plenty on you, Tony, and I might use it. If you make me, see? Yes, yes, I see, I see. Another thing I see is that I pay the orchestra to rehearse, not to referee a love match. Come on, let's try that ending again. Okay, fellas, okay. The job is number. Pick it up eight bars from the finish. Okay, girl. That's it, Fran. Now you've got it. A one and two and finish. Ah, swell. 
Well, 12, see? I told you it'd be good. Okay, but I still think it's right from the silo. Now, let's try it with that blue spotlight. Blue spotlight? Are you nuts, Tony? You know what blue does to me. Look, Fran, it's got to be blue. This number's supposed to be mysterious, see? Oh. All the light's out and just that blue baby spot on you. Don't forget you're covered from head to foot with those jewels. You mean I'm covered from head to foot with that stinking oil? All right. I tell all you, Tony, right. it gets all over me. When I finish, I feel like I've been in an oil well. So what? You can wash it off after the number. Well, it's the only thing that'll make those cheap sparklers gleam. Now, quit beefing, friend. This number will knock them dead. Well, I hope you know what you're doing. I always do, baby. Okay, boys, from the beginning now, please. <laughs> I speak to you for a minute? Why, Paula, you can do more than that to me, beautiful. Come over here. What's on your mind, sugar? It's that costume of Miss Francine's. You know, it's just net. And with all those phony jewels on it, Tony, I won't be able to get her into it fast. Oh, forget the costume, baby. Concentrate on yours truly for a change. You know, honey, you do things to me. Mr. Tony, please. Not here. Someone will see you. Miss Francine, she's looking. I'll let her look. I'm crazy about you, baby. You know that, don't you? But Tony, Miss Francine... Leave that to me, baby. Little Tony will fix everything, everything. See? You will make Paula the great dancer, no? I'll do more than that. You'll have cars, jewels, furs, the works. Careful, Tony. She's coming. Stop that music. Stop the music. Say, what's going on here between you two? Paula, I told you to stay in the dressing room and finish my costume, didn't I? Yes, ma'am. It was just that I wanted to ask Mr. Kaplan a question about it. Oh, yes? Well, ask me from now on. You've been asking Mr. Kaplan a lot of questions lately, and he's been giving you an awful lot of answers. Oh, come on, Fran. Can't a guy be polite to a nice little girl? Not when he works so hard at it. You lay off, do you hear? Next time I catch her hanging around you, little Paula won't live here anymore. All right, all right. Well, if you'll take my advice, you'll put your other expression back on in the county you got company. Don't look now. I think the white hope of the Forsyth fortune is headed this way. Monty? The kid himself, the heir to the Forsyth. I'm just about ready for the squeeze play. What do you think, Fran? Will the fish play? If he won't, I will. <laughs> Why, Monty, how sweet of you to drop in. Francine, I've got to see you now. I've got to talk to you. Why, of course, Monty, I'm... Sure, Mr. Kaplan can hold up the rehearsal for a few minutes. Oh, why, certainly, certainly. Boys, suppose we run over that hula now. Uh, let's go to my dressing room. It's cozy up there. Well, Monty, suppose you've come to talk to me about those letters again. But, Francine, you don't understand. Those letters are very important to me. But, Sugar, they're very important to me, too. They're so sweet. I've never had such letters before. That's just it, Francine. You see, I'm in the diplomatic service. If those letters ever get out, well, I mean, they aren't very discreet. It would mean the end of my career almost before I started. Mm, yes, I see it. Wouldn't be so good if anybody else saw them. Well, I guess you can have them back. Oh, Francine, you're wonderful. I knew you'd understand. I knew you'd give them back to me. Give them back? Well, it amounts to that, I guess, but... There's a favor I've got to ask of you in return, Monty. Of course, Francine, anything. Well, you see, I'm afraid I've been a bit extravagant lately, and I'm terribly hard up. I see. Yes, I see perfectly. How much? Now, don't be mad, sugar. It's only a thousand pounds. A thousand pounds? But that's impossible. I haven't that much money. I wouldn't know where to get it. That's your business, Mr. Diplomat. Well, I'm giving you a bargain. That's because I like you so much. I just think what the Daily Comet would pay me for... All the right, about... you win. But I've got to have time. Why, of course, sugar. You can have plenty of time. Shall we say, um, tonight? Tonight? Yes, tonight. After my first show. The dough is to be in an unmarked wallet. And whoever brings it walks up to Tony Kaplan and says, uh, I beg your pardon, you dropped your wallet. Kaplan? So he's in on it, too. I might have known... A pretty little game. Yes, we thought so too, but now I'm tired of playing. So don't you forget, bring that thousand pounds tonight or else. Make it after my first show here at the Orient Club.
I'm sorry, sir, there are no tables. What oh, would I say, Armand? Sorry, sir, we are entirely full. Armand, please. Sorry, madame, but you see. Oh, good evening, Sir Henry. Well, Armand, you have my regular table, of course. But of course, monsieur. Ah, fine. Well, Sir Henry Merivale, there is always the table. <laughs> right this way, if you please, monsieur. Ah, you see, there you are, Matthews. Simple when you know how, isn't it? <laughs> yes. Come along. I do, Chief. I don't see how you do it. Don't you? Personality, my boy. Personality, <laughs> only that. Here you are, Sir Henry. Table 16, as usual. Ah, very good, Armand. Thank you. Oh, up here. Thank you, monsieur. Oh, this is very nice. Well, I got your message to meet you here, H.M. I must admit, I don't know why we're here, sir. Are we, um, slumming? Why, not exactly. We're here, Matthews, because this club, the Orient, is run by two of the slickest crooks I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Really? Tony Kaplan and Francine Rapport. And because Scotland Yard has complaints about a new and highly ingenious racket, they're presumably working. Pocket picking in the futurist manner. What? <laughs> oh, I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. Well, let me explain. You see, a guest here with a good many drinks inside him seldom remembers exactly how much money he has in his wallet. Now, if that wallet is lifted and deftly returned, minus three pounds, say, or a fiver, he simply assumes he must have spent it. I see. The method is harmless and very nearly undetectable, but the takings each week must be enormous. <laughs> very ingenious. Yes, isn't it? I say, hmm? there's an interesting-looking girl. That one in white at the next table. What? Why, H.M. Eh? Oh, no, no, I don't mean aesthetically. Uh, in this case, I mean professionally. <laughs> She's just dropped a man-sized wallet on the floor. She seemed very nervous when she picked it up again. I a wonder... man's wallet? <laughs> what would she be doing with a man's wallet? I'm sure I don't know, but I mean to find out. Now, the floor show is about to start. Tonight, tonight, Francine offers for your approval for the first time a new dance. The Javanese Temple Dance. <laughs> I say, Jim. Yes? Look, that girl in white we were just talking about. She's leaving her table. She's going into the bar. Uh, follow her, man. Find out where she's going and report to me. Right, sir. I say, bartender. Did a uh, lady in white just come in here? Yes, sir. She went in there, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, sorry, you can't go in there, sir. I think I can. Here. I'm a police officer. Uh, oh, police. Yes. Now, where does that door lead to? Uh, to the dressing room, sir. Oh, I see. But the girl did go in there. Oh, yes, sir. All right. Out of my way, please. Uh, yes, sir. Let me by, please. Wait a minute. Not so fast, young lady. <laughs> Would you uh, mind telling me what you did with that wallet you put in your handbag a minute ago? Wallet? Really? What wallet? Now, look. I'm a police officer. Oh, I see. One of those persons who have a good time here and then arrest the management for selling drinks after hours. No, I have nothing to do with that. But would you mind explaining what you were doing with that wallet? I, I suppose I'll have to. I picked it up off the floor. Oh, picked it up? Yes, it's quite true. Not being able to appreciate the charms of Miss Francine Rapport, which evidently stagger you men so, I went to the bar during her dance. On the way, I picked up the wallet. Naturally, when the lights went up, I wanted to find the proper owner. And why didn't you? Well, what do you think I'm doing here? Miss Rapport, I understand, is part owner here. I'm sorry if the proper prestige is to stand on the table and shout that you found a wallet. I thought of taking it to Miss Rapport. Oh, I see. And uh, did you give it to her? No, she, she isn't here. Evidently, she didn't come back here after her dance. Perhaps you'll be good enough to let me pass so I can take the wallet to Mr. Kaplan. Now, just a minute, please. Oh, right. You can come with me. No, let's say you come with me. 
Bria, going back to Francine's dressing room. No, I won't. I, Come I, with I won't. me, I said. Is um, this Miss Raffles' dressing room? Yes. Well, then. You'll soon find out if she's here or not, eh? You see, I told her she wasn't here. Yes, so you did. But uh, if you don't mind, I think I'll just make sure. Wait, you can't go in there. Huh? Well, who are you? Paula, Miss Raffles' maid. Oh, then um, open the door. I'm a police officer, and I want to see her. But you Come can't... along. Very well. <gasps> oh. What's this? Oh. She's dead. I didn't do it. I swear I didn't do it. Murdered. Stabbed in the back of a pair of scissors. Let me out of here. Let me out of here. Stay where you are, both of you. And now, folks, the medley of dancing hits, beginning with the favorite of yesterday and today, with Grace. Close that door, please. All right, now you. You told me your name is Paula. Miss Rafford's maid? Yes, sir. Were you here when Miss Rafford came back from her dance a few minutes ago? No. No, I was not. I can prove I was not. She met me at the end of the passageway. Gave me a message to take through Mr. Kaplan to come back and see her. I went and told him. I was out there. Mr. Kaplan can tell you that. All right, now, all right. Steady. Uh, Paula, do you know where table 16 is? Yes, sir. All right, at table 16, you'll find a big, heavy-set man with a sandy, ruddy complexion. His name is Sir Henry Merivale. Ask him if he'll come in here right away, will you? But don't say a word about this to anyone else. Have you got that? Yes, sir. Can't I go now? Please, I can't stand looking at her there. I'm sorry. I'm afraid I'll have to ask you to remain where you are. Let's see. This in her hand. Scrap of paper, hmm? Evidently left when the murderer snatched the rest of it from her grasp. Got to see you, ever your adoring Monty. Monty. Oh, you know him. No I, no, I don't. But you knew she was dead. Why didn't you tell me? You must have known I saw you come out of this room. You think I'm insane. You'd only have thought what you're thinking now. But I didn't kill her. I came in here. I found her dead. All I wanted to do was to get away. I don't expect you to believe that. I probably wouldn't believe it myself if I were in your place. Then, what about that wallet? Tony Catlin's wallet. You might as well know now. Oh, you stole it. No, I didn't steal it. He dropped it. He dropped? He dropped it, I tell you. You still got the wallet? Well, I... You better let me have it. Here it is. Thank you. thousand pounds. What's going on here? Who are you? Steady, Catlin. Don't touch what? anything. She's dead. Francine. Yes, Catlin. We... They got her. She was all I had. Who did it? Tell me. Take Who did it? Easy, it? I'll kill him. Who's that girl? I can't. What's she you. doing here? Well, she told me she'd found your wallet. Yes, that's right. Now, Mr. Matthew, you can clear up one thing. I mean, about that wallet. Mr. Kaplan can clear it up. I saw him drop it. He can tell you who I am, too. He can vouch for me. All right, Kaplan. Is this your wallet? What wallet? Where? What are you talking about? Does this wallet belong to you? Certainly not. I suppose you'll say that you don't know why I'm here either. Madam, I don't know what you're talking about. I only know that Francine is dead. Dead, do you understand? I love Francine. I come in here to find a stat with a pair of scissors. And all you people can do is babble about a wallet, a wallet. Oh, I don't know who you are. I never saw you before in my life. Did you kill her? Did you? Did you? I've done a lot of things in my life. To judge by the number of police in my club tonight, they think I've done a lot more. But I couldn't have killed Francine. I never left that orchestra platform from the time Francine was dancing until just a moment ago. Fifty people will testify to that. Once in my life, I'm in the clear when dirty work's been done. This kind of dirty work, this kind. What kind of dirty work, Tony? Who are you? Sir Henry. Oh, boy, Chief, am I glad to see you. Why, thank you, Jim. Hello, copper. Come to run us all in? No. Francine's maid told me. I've telephoned divisional headquarters about our unfortunate homicide here. They'll take charge. No, I really came to break up your newest and I think most ingenious racket. I don't get you. I... This is a test for the air raid warning protection. This is a test.
There is no air raid at this time. The first fighter command, New York, requests that all radio broadcast stations receiving this test transmit time when signal was received by telegraph to first fighter command, New York. These tests will continue at certain intervals. If it is ever necessary to close broadcast stations due to enemy air raid attack, your station will make a short announcement of the fact when it goes off the air. This is only a test. Thank you. This wallet contains the blackmail money that Kaplan and Miss Rapport wanted from your brother for his letters to Miss Rapport, doesn't it? No, no. You're it's... crazy. You were instructed to hand the money to Kaplan in public in the presence of witnesses in a wallet with a little speech... This is your wallet, isn't it? It's not you true. You can't get away you went with to it. give it to him by the orchestra platform, but at the last minute you lost your nerve, didn't you? No, I So didn't. you followed Francine in here and tried to fling it at her instead. You're trying to trick me. That's another one of their little games. Nice, safe blackmail. They used to pull that one in Paris. You're going a little fast, aren't you, copper? You could get into trouble, you know, talking like that. Making accusations you can't prove out of nothing. Uh, not exactly nothing, Anthony. Monty Forsythe telephoned us, but then he lost his nerve and refused to set a trap. There was nothing else we could do about it. Well, what else could I do? I had to get back those letters Monty wrote her. He won't help himself. I... Well, Look here, Miss Forsythe. I seem to have made a fool of myself. I'm sorry. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Matthews. You may not have caught a pickpocket, but how do you know you haven't caught a murderess? Look there at that piece of paper in Francine's hand. That's torn off one of my brother's letters. And our wonderful Mr. Kaplan knows it as well as I do. I don't know what Francine was up to. About letters, that is. She wanted to sell some letters. That was her business. But if there were letters, where are they now? Well, here's part of one at any rate. You know, it's strange what soft hands and arms Francine has. Hmm. Uh, by the way, Miss Forsythe, did you get the letters? No, no, no. I have told you she was dead when I got here. I was only here half a minute anyway. I haven't got any letters. Well, you can search me if you like. Kaplan had the letters. He probably still has them. I never had any letters. Maybe your brother got him. Didn't this copper say he's here tonight? What's his alibi? You know you really are a nasty bit of work. That may be. We're none of us perfect, not even you. But you see, Miss So-and-so, you're in a jam, a bad jam. Now, I'm not in a jam at all. I didn't kill that poor kid. I couldn't have killed her. The coppers themselves will tell you I never left that orchestra platform at any time. Is that true? Yes, it's quite true. Yeah. See? No, I, I don't see. All I know is that it cost Monty and me nearly everything we've got to scrape that money together. There must be lots of poor fools like us. The clever ones of this world have it all their own way, haven't they? Mm, oh, I think not, Miss Forsythe. No. Uh, come in. Oh, it's you, Paula. Come in and close that door, please. Paula. Paula. Uh, haven't I seen you somewhere before? Maybe you have. I was at the Tin Hat Club two, three years. No, no, no. I've never been at the Tin Hat Club. No, no. Haven't I seen you more recently than that? I don't know. Very well, we'll skip that. How many dressing rooms are there here? Two besides this. Any other principals aside from Miss Rapport? No. And the chorus girls, did they change in these rooms? I'll answer any of your I'm questions. I'm talking to Paula now. No, on the other side. Miss Rapport not let them. When did you last see Miss Rapport alive? I passed here when she came back off the floor. She gave me a message for Mr. Kaplan. Ah, so you have an alibi too, eh? Tony, you're a good dance director, aren't you? Yes, I guess so. What's that got to do with it? Do you suppose you could teach Paula here to do that temple dance, now that Francine won't be able to dance it any longer? Oh, I suppose it. Look here, H.M., what are you getting at? In fact, you've already taught her, haven't you, Tony? No, certainly not. Did you notice the dance finished three measures too soon tonight, Tony? Didn't that worry you? Have you gone up your rocker? I think not. Let me have a look at your hands, Paula. My hands? Yes, both of them. If you're saying Paula had anything to do with killing Francine, you're wrong. She was out on the dance floor with me the whole time. Fifty witnesses can prove it. No doubt. And if you're saying she's a pickpocket, you must be completely off your nut. What do you think you'll find in her hand anyway? Beeswax? No, not at all. 
No, only oil. Oil? You're quite right. She was out on that dance floor the entire time. She's got oil on her hands and arms, Tony. How did she get it there? Let me alone. How should I? I'll tell you. From the oil that was smeared on those jewels on her costume while she was on that floor dancing. Why was she out there dancing instead of Francine, Tony? Or shall I tell you that too? You're crazy. Because Francine was in here, dead. Wasn't she, Tony? No, no. You killed Francine before the dance. No. Then you went out to the bandstand and Paula took Francine's place. You were sure no one would recognize her in that dark blue light with her Japanese headdress on. No. Paula, keep your trap shut. Everybody assumed it was Francine, would swear they saw her alive. And everybody would swear they saw you out there all the time. A pretty alibi, Tony. Yeah, that's right. I got a swell alibi, Carver. Try and break it down. Well, Paula, who is it to be? You or him? No, I didn't kill him. He'll rat on you, Paula. You know that, don't you? Yes, I'll tell him. Why, you black-hearted double-crushing rat. He did her, Captain, or you'll get hurt. He killed her. He killed her with scissors. He say you dance. Nothing happened. He promised marry me. I do nothing, nothing. All right. Constable. You caught me? Yes, Constable. Take them away. Right, you will, sir. A nasty customer, Jim. All right, sir. They both are. Well, it was lucky for you Paula didn't have time to wash that oil off her arms. You might never have caught her. Yes, yes, that helped, but... Uh, it was plain from the first that there'd been a substitution of identities. For well, the first, Sir Henry? Yes. Well, I don't see how. <laughs> well, Jim, as you know, I have an eye for a pretty girl. But uh, that's not all. Whatever you might say about Francine Rapport, she was a magnificent dancer. I didn't know who it was dancing out there tonight, but I knew it wasn't Francine. <laughs> You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week... Murder Clinic will bring you one of the best-known and best-beloved figures in all crime fiction, Agatha Christie's Hercule Poirot, the man with the little gray cells. The story is the tragedy at Marsden Manor, in which Poirot double-crosses a double-crosser. Tonight's detective was H.M. Merivale, played by Roland Winters. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adapted by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. 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 This is the Mutual Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's great detectives of fiction. Men against murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the great figures of crime detection and brings you his most exciting case. Tonight, Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, in the tragedy at Marsden Manor. Evening, Monsieur Poirot. I'd recognize you anywhere, I think, thanks to those magnificent mustachios of yours. Merci bien. They are very magnificent, no? They are indeed. 
Uh, tell me, did they help you solve the tragedy at Marsden Manor? Uh, no. It was the little gray cells in the brain of the great Hercule Poirot that prevented this great miscarriage of justice in the death of Richard Maltravers of Marsden Manor. It all began in the little village of Marsden Lee, less than a hundred kilometers from London. Coming? Coming? Yes, yes, what is it? Be you Dr. Bernard? Yes, I am. Come quick, the master's done for. You mean Mr. Maltravers of the manor? Aye, the master. The mistress, she says, fetch the doctor, she says. But it beant no use. He's a dead un. I knows a dead un when I see un. What was it, man, an accident? No, beant no accident. I found him in the lower meadow, with the blood running out of his mouth. Be a stroke. A stroke? That's what it be. Well, hurry, man, hurry, man, let go. Come, come now, Mrs. Beltravers. You must get hold of yourself. The Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. After all, we are all of us mortal. But, but why, Richard? He was so good, so kind. Why did this have to happen to him? Oh, come, come, please. He seems so well, so full of life. Why, only last week he passed a medical examination for insurance. How could he have died so suddenly? Doctor, what happened? The hemorrhage. Due to stomach ulcers, undoubtedly, resulting in a stroke. Ah, bonjour, Mr. Hyde. Hello, Poirot. You know my good friend, Captain Hastings, no? Good morning, Captain Hastings. Good morning, sir. Well, Poirot, you got my message, I see. I did. What is it that disturbs you, mon ami? Your Richard Maltravers dies. You sent for Poirot. What was the cause of Monsieur Maltravers' death? The death certificate says a hemorrhage resulting in a stroke due to stomach ulcers. But surely you did not bring Papa Poirot here to talk of the stomach ulcers. These <laughs> Richard Maltravers had taken out the insurance policy in your company, no? And what a policy. For 50,000 pounds. Well, a good square sum, that, eh? <laughs> Rather. So, what is it you wish me to do? It is unfortunate for your company, but everything seems, uh, how you say... Uh, open and above the plank, no? <laughs> no, Puerro. Open and above board. Ah, my good friend, the great Hastings. Always he corrects the English of Hercule Poirot. <laughs> Monsieur Wright, I ask you, do I not speak the English of a, of a super? <laughs> you do indeed. But to get back to your previous question, what my company wishes you to do is to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Maltravers' death. So, what is it you suspect, mon ami? Well... Of course, you know, in the case of suicide, the policy is invalid. Yes. And when a man past the prime of life takes out an unusually large policy in favor of a young wife half his age and then dies within two weeks, the possibility of suicide cannot be ignored. Oh, be certain, mon ami. But suicide by hemorrhage? That is a queer saucepan of fish. Now, if the cause of death had been heart failure, ah, then I would smell a mouse. Heart failure can always mean that a, a stupid doctor did not find the true cause. But hemorrhage, ma foi, hemorrhage is, well, the, the, uh, hemorrhage. Exactly. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are determined to proceed with the matter. You will undertake the inquiry? But of course. Hastings, that great professor of English, shall go with me. <laughs> hey, mon ami? <laughs> Gladly, Poirot. Uh, eh bien. Now, where is this place, this Marsdon Manor? You take the Great Eastern Line from Liverpool Station to the little town of Marsden Lee. Marsden Manor is about a mile from the village. Mm, Marsden Lee. All right, Hastings, we go. This is Marsden Lee, eh? I hope we can get a conveyance up to the manor. Tickets, tickets, sir. Ah, here you are, my friend. I suppose you'll be coming down for the funeral, sir. Funeral? Uh, what funeral? Uh, you say you made the funeral of Master Maltravers. About oh. the manor. Oh, you say the manor. 
Uh, could that be Marsden Manor? Aye, it be. Hmm, that is a not coincidence. Uh, my friend and I, we have come down with a thought of uh, buying this Marsden Manor. You couldn't pay me to live there, you couldn't. Why not? It be haunted. Haunted? Aye, haunted. Seen things there, folks says. Yeah, we should see. Now, could you tell us where uh, Dr. Bernard lives? Aye, up yon hill, about half a mile. Yeah. Come, he stinks. Dr. Bernard, that you signed the death certificate of a Mr. Richard Maltravers. Yes, I did. You understand, Doctor, with such a big policy, we must make the careful investigation. Of course, of course. I suppose he was such a rich man, his life was insured for a big sum. Hmm? You consider him a rich man, Doctor? Well, was he not? He kept two cars, you know, and Marsden Manor is a pretty big place to keep up. Mm. Although I believe he bought it very cheaply. I understand he had had uh, considerable losses of late. Mm, is that so? Indeed. Mm. It's fortunate for his widow, then, that there is this insurance. Yes, yes. Very beautiful and charming young creature, but terribly unstrung by this sad catastrophe. I've tried to spare her all I could, but of course the shock has been very great. Why shock? These ulcers of the stomach, uh, they are what uh, you call chronic, yes, eh? yes. They are not sudden. No. Did mm. you not attend uh, Mr. Maltravers before, Doctor? My dear sir, I never attended him. What? I understand Mr. Maltravers was a member of a faith healing sect. But you examined the body? Certainly. I was fetched by one of the under gardeners. And the cause of death was clear? Absolutely. There was blood on the lips, but most of the bleeding must have been internal. He had not been moved? No, no, the body hadn't been touched. He had evidently been out shooting crows and a long-barreled bird gun lay beside him. The hemorrhage must have occurred quite suddenly. Gastric ulcers, without a doubt. He could not have been shot, huh? My dear sir, I beg pardon. But I remember once a doctor who said heart failure until the constable showed him a bullet wound for the head. Mm, you hmm? will find no bullet wounds on the body or head of Mr. Maltravers. Now, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, I... Thank you, Doctor. Uh, uh, just one more thing. You saw no need for the autopsy, huh? Certainly not. The cause of death was perfectly clear. In my profession, we see no need to distress unduly the relatives of a dead patient. Now, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me, good day. Well, Hastings, what do you think of our good Dr. Bernard? <laughs> Bit of an old fool. Precisely. Your judgments of character are always profound, mon ami. Except where a young and beautiful woman is concerned. So now you must uh, mind your Q's and P's. Because the good doctor has said that the next one we see is both young and beautiful. This Madame Maltravers. <laughs> Travers, I cannot tell you how I am sorry to bother you in this way. Must I be bothered now? I know nothing about this insurance of my husband. Courage, madame. It is necessary. I will do all to make this matter not too unpleasant for you. I, Hercule Poirot, swear it. Now, if you would recount briefly the sad events of last Wednesday, huh? Well, I was changing for tea when the maid came up. One of the gardeners had just run up to the house. He'd found Richard. No, oh, I can't point end. Enough. Uh -huh. You had seen your husband earlier in the afternoon? No, not since lunch. I'd walked down to the village for some stamps. I believe he was out pottering around the grounds. Uh, shooting the crows, no? Yes, so I understand. He usually took his bird gun with him. In fact, I heard one or two shots at a distance. So? Where is this bird gun now? I, in the gun cabinet over there, I suppose. With your permission, madame. Yeah, here it is. Ah. Two shots fired, I see. And now, madame, a delicate question. Monsieur Maltravers, your husband, is awaiting burial, I believe. Yes. He's lying in his room. Uh, if I might see? Why, yes, of course. It's the, the first room at the top of the stairs. You'll forgive me if I don't go with you. What, of course. Hastings, you are many old madame. Do you think Mr. Poirot will understand why I didn't go with him? Oh, I can assure you, Mrs. Maltravers, Poirot is most sympathetic. I don't doubt it, Mr. Hastings. 
I only wish there was more that I could tell him. Oh, I understand. But I wonder, Mrs. Maltravers, if you could tell me one thing. Oh, yes? Well, the station master, an odd character named Volk, said something about Marsden Manor being haunted. Marsden Manor haunted? Why, surely you're joking, Mr. Hastings. Oh, no, no, I assure you. He told us that people have seen things. We well, must have been referring to my my humble experiments in extrasensory perception. I've always been tremendously intrigued by that subject, and doubtless some of our servants have been gossiping. Madame, you are mediumistic. How fascinating. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Mr. Poirot. I've dabbled a bit, that's all. So? I've managed uh, table levitation and simple things like that. Hmm. But I suppose to the simple rustics around here, it looks like black magic. Very interesting. Under kinder circumstances, I would implore a demonstration. Why, uh, are you interested in such things, Mr. Poirot? All fields of knowledge interest the great Poirot. Uh, Poirot, don't you think perhaps we'd better... Oh, I, I forgot, madame. Uh, I thank you for your so great courtesy. I do not think you need be bothered any further by the matter. Uh, by the way, do you know anything of your husband's financial position? Nothing, whatever, I'm afraid. I'm very stupid about business. I see. Then you can give us no clue as to why your husband suddenly decided to insure his life. Oh, was it sudden? I'm sure I don't know. Enfin. And now, with your permission, madame, we will go. Hastings? Oh, uh, I'll see you to the door. Merci. Oh, uh, just one more thing, madame. Could you tell me, when they found Mr. Maltravers, did they find him unshod uh, without the shoes? Why, really, Mr. Poirot, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it is nothing. It does not matter. And now, madame, adieu. Oh, but look, you have another visitor. Someone is coming up to walk, huh? Archie! Hello, you! Andy. Why, I, I thought you were on your way back to Australia. Yes, I was. But I read the news of Uncle's death in Paris and hurried back. Emily, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? Anything? Oh, of course not. What could you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Mr. Poirot, this is Captain Black, my husband's nephew. Uh, Captain Black, Mr. Hastings. How do you Emily, how did this happen? Uncle seemed perfectly well when I was here Monday night. You've evidently read the papers, Archie. You must know what happened. But they gave no details, just the bare notice of his death. What happened? Archie, I... I just can't go through all that again. Yes, Captain Black, I'm afraid my friend and I, we have disturbed Madame. What are you doing here? I am Hercule Poirot. The Hercule Poirot. Uh, Mr. Poirot is from the insurance company, Archie. That's just why I've come back. To protect you from annoyances like you this. You shouldn't have risked your job, Archie. I if you left right away, you might still get to Paris in time to make your boat train. Uh, you say Paris, mon capitaine. You go to Australia by way of Paris? Why, yes. I intended taking the Orient Express from there and pick up the Pacific Mail at Port Said. Ah, oui. That shortens the journey, does it not? You are staying here, Captain Black? Yes, I'm staying at the Pig and Thistle. That's the inn down in the village. Ah, village inn. It serves the roast beef, no? Uh, why, yes, I suppose so. Good. So, Hastings, let us try this roast beef at the Pig and Thistle, huh? Poirot, now you've had your roast beef. Hadn't we better be getting back to London? No, not so fast, my good Hastings. London, she will not run away. But uh. this Captain Black, he may do so. A garçon, garçon. For heaven's sake, Poirot, English inns don't have garçon. No? Then who is it who approaches? What do you have, Governor? For my friend, the dictionary. For me, a, a, a buck. <laughs> he means beer, George. I mean the ale. Right, oh, Governor. Uh, you've been up at the manor, sir? I? I mean, yes, we have. We sad business, that. I knew no good had come of it as soon as they took the manor. Uh, you mean this, uh, Maltravers? Uh, they were not popular? Well, uh, not that, Governor. He was a bit too old for her, if you know what I mean. Oh, sir. She might better have married the nephew. At least, ways on. i better Bob the nephew thought, sir. Ah, there has been the gossip, huh? Eh? Oh, I wouldn't go so far as that, Governor. But he did hang around a bit. And the husband, uh, Mr. Maltravers? He object? Not as I knows of, Gavney. But why is my opinion, I ain't. Mm. Without a doubt, it is the worst opinion, non, George? But, ah, the Captain Black, here he comes now. 
Hello, Poro. Here you are. Oh, Captain Black. <laughs> Come, will you not join us? <laughs> Bark, perhaps? Yes, thanks. I don't mind if I do. Wait, a mug of ale. Oh, no, Governor. Sad business, this death of your uncle, huh? Yes, and so sudden, too. He seemed in excellent health when I dined with him Monday night. So? And was he also in good spirits? What did he say? Or what was the talk at this dinner Monday night? Oh, I don't know. The usual general topics. I see. My uncle asked about my people. We talked of Australia. Yes. Then Mrs. Maltravers asked a lot of questions about East Africa, where I've spent some time. I told them one or two yarns. That's about all, I think. Madame Maltravers uh, seems much upset at the death of her husband, no? Naturally. They've been married less than a year. So I hear. A remarkable woman, this lady. Remarkable in what way? What do you mean? She has, uh, how you say, the seeing eye. I hear her tell Hastings. She does the seance. Uh, he seems most interested, no, Hastings? Oh, I, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, always the conservative Hastings. Me, uh, I am not so. Well, Mr. Poirot, don't tell me you believe in this psychic stuff. Oh, I have not the closed mind. For example, Captain Black, you have told us all that your conscious self knows. Now, with your permission, I would question your subconscious, huh? Psychoanalysis, eh? Well, it's nonsense, but I don't mind. Merci. It is like this. I give you a word. You answer with another word. Any word. The first word you think of. Eh bien, shall we begin? Go ahead. Hey, Stings, note yes. down the words, please. Oh, very well, Paul. Now, day. Night. Name. Place. Bernard. Shore. Monday. Dinner. Journey. Ship. Country. Uganda. Story. Lions. Bird gun. Farm. Shot. Suicide. Elephant. Tusks. Money. Lawyers. So, that is all. You are a good subject, mon capitaine. You don't mean to tell me that rigmarole means anything to you. Maybe not. But nevertheless, you are a good subject. <laughs> well, if you don't need me anymore, I think I'll go upstairs and unpack. Shall I see you again before you leave, Mr. Poirot? Yes, I should not be surprised. Good. See you later. Au revoir, mon capitaine. And now, my clever instincts, you see it all, no? Oh, I don't know what you mean, Poirot. Does that list of words tell you nothing? Uh, sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't. Then I will assist you. To begin with, the Capitan answered within the time limit. No pauses, no making up the mind. Mm -hmm. Day to night and place to name are normal associations. Then I give him Bernard, the name of the doctor, if he knew him. Oh. Evidently he does not. When I say Bernard, he says sure. Monday means dinner, country as Uganda. Story recalls the lion story he tells them. All uh, natural. But now, notice... When I mention bird gun, I get the unexpected answer, farm. When I say shot, he answers at once, suicide. A man he knows commits suicide with a bird gun on a farm somewhere. <coughs> Imbecile that I am! The great Hercule Poirot is, is hoodwinked. What are you talking about? Do you not see Hastings? That is the story the Captain Black told at the dinner Monday night. Oh, I see. And you think that gave Maltravers the idea? You think he shot himself in the mouth with that bird gun? Why not? Remember, the bird gun has a very tiny charge of powder. The bullet would remain lodged in the brain. All that would show would be the blood in the mouth. Come, Hastings. It is not too late. Of course, but, but where? To see once more this dead man, to Marsden Manor. Hastings, to Marsden Manor. <laughs> Mrs. Maltravers, it is true. Your husband shot himself through the mouth with the bird gun. You mean suicide? It would seem so, madame. But the insurance... Naturally, madame, the suicide will void the policy. It is unfortunate, but huh, what will you? Oh, but this is impossible. 
My husband would never commit suicide. It's, it's inconceivable. But the evidence, madame, it is conclusive. No. There must be some other explanation. You mean uh, murder, madame? Well, of course, that is always possible. But no, no, not likely, I'm afraid. But you do admit it's possible. You just said it was possible. Yes, of course, everything is possible. Have you any idea who might have wished to kill your husband? Why, no. No, I haven't. Madame, I have a suggestion. It is bizarre, no doubt, but perhaps if you are willing to help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, anything. Madame, you are mediumistic. Perhaps if you would try, perhaps you could... Perhaps you're right. Perhaps I could get through to Richard. He might tell us what happened. I am sure you could do it, madame. Yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, come back here tonight at eight and bring Captain Black with you. Eh bien, madame, I am sure you will succeed. Until eight, madame, au revoir. We are on time, as you see. Hastings and I have brought Captain Black with us. I say there's a bad storm coming up. Would that interfere with the experiment? Certainly not, Mr. Hastings. This isn't mumbo-jumbo. The weather has nothing to do with it. Well, well. Let us proceed, huh? Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, will you draw chairs up around this table, please? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, now, Mr. Hastings, if you'll put out the lights. Certainly. Now, remain perfectly quiet, please. No matter what you hear or see. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me, Richard? Can you hear me? If you can, rap. Rap three times. Did you hear that? Ah, but of course, madame. Did you not tell him to rap three times? That's how Richard always used to knock. Perhaps he is outside. No. They say the suicide never rests, always returns. Listen. What was that? The front door slammed. What? No, Captain Black. It was but the thunder. Listen. Where are I? I hear footsteps. It is the wind, madame. I will close the door. Ah, I have locked it. Uh, don't do that. If it should open now... Oh! I Jove, it is open. He's there. There in the doorway. I see nothing, madame. I saw him, I tell you. My husband, you must have seen him too. Look. She's right. He is there. His hand. Look, it's pointing. What's that light coming from? Pointing at her. What did you... Her hand. Her right hand. It is scarlet with blood. Blood? Yes, it's blood. I killed him. I did it. Take her away. Take her away. Lights. Good heavens, Poro. She's got away through that window. Do not worry, mon capitaine. The good inspector Jap outside will stop her. Good heavens, then. 
That lovely creature, a murderer. And a very clever one, my susceptible Hastings. After all, she could not know she would come up against the great Hercule Poirot. And she might even have fooled me if she had only taken off his shoe. His shoe, Poirot? Only with his toe could he himself have pulled the trigger of this bird gun. And parbleu, his shoes were still on when they found him. But I don't understand. This seance, was it all fake? Mais certainement. She meant to pull the sheep. Ah, wool. No. Very well, wool. But it was I who pulled the sheep's wool over her eyes. Thanks to my good friend Henri Dubois, who played the part of the husband's ghost, and Papa Poirot, who put the red paint on her hand in the dark. But what was her idea in having this seance? Parbleu, mon capitaine. Do you not see? Madame, she will go into the trance. She will hear the voice. She will come out from the trance. She will, with the great reluctance, name the murderer. You mean she meant to confess? Mais non, mon capitaine. She meant to name you. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings to you each week one exciting case. Tonight, the tragedy of Marsden Manor, with Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, played by Maurice Tottenham. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Fred Irving Anderson's Deputy Farr, the Vermont farmer who became chief of the Homicide Bureau in New York City. Deputy Parr, the man with the nose for murder. The story is Gulf Stream Green, in which the deputy proves that conceit of murderers is colossal. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. The speaking. The speaking. The speaking. Murder Clinic, stories of the world's great detectives of fiction. Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of these great hunters of men and brings you the story of his most exciting case. Tonight, he is Frederick Irving Anderson's famous detective, Police Deputy Parr, that visitor from a Vermont farm often called the man with a nose for murder. Good evening, Deputy Parr. You're going to tell us the story called Gulf Stream Green. Now, why have you chosen that particular story? Well, it, uh, it illustrates rather perfectly, I think, a pet theory of mine, that the egotism of murderers is enormous. I've even had them call me up. <laughs> Lucky for us, it makes our work that much easier. Now, let me be more specific. About, about four o'clock of a late fall afternoon some years ago, the glamorous Leo Cardi, world-famed opera star, descended from a limousine before the swagger dressmaking shop of Estrell Incorporated, just off Fifth Avenue. Madame Estrell, look, it's Leo Cardi. I must go to the door and welcome her. 
Girls, please. You must forgive their excitement, madame. Ah, by now I am used to the stress. You do not mind me coming here and making all this upset? How can you ask? Oh, my good, good friends, they tell me, stay away. For if I, I come, I bring this swarm of, uh, I should say, uh, uh, no ghosts. Well, this is one way to get rid of them. Let's go into my private room. Please, hey, that might be better. Now, Madame Mercadier, what can I do for you? A stage gun, perhaps? No, no, Estrelle. Some, something else. Oh, my, but it's good to be able to drop up that phony accent. Why, Madame Mercadier, you, you had me fooled completely. <laughs> Fools everybody. <laughs> it is for the art. It's charming. <laughs> but, madame, if it is not for a gown, why have you come to me? Can you lend me some girl who could wear my clothes? Oh, oh I see, of course. To save you the bother for fitting. No, no, no. I want some girl who could wear this gown I have on now. But I don't, don't understand. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter. Do you have such a girl? Why, yes, probably. Will you stand that up for a minute, minute, please? Yes, I... I, I think I have a very good. Just a minute. Bertha. Yes, yes ma'am. Will you come in here, please? In just a minute. She'll be here in a moment, Madame Lercardi. When did you want to do your, your gown? I wanted to take my place now. Now? I must have an hour alone, undisturbed. But this is all very bewildering, Madame. Quiet. I'll explain later. Here comes the girl now. Come in, Bertha. Come in and close the door, please. Yes, ma'am. Oh, but she is perfect. Uh, my child, you will accept this dress from Leocardi? Your dress for me? You like it? It is the new Gulfstream green that today I introduce to the world. Tomorrow it will be famous. Ranel Frey created it for me. And now it is yours. But, but madame... Come, Mestrel, help me out of it. Yes, yes madame. Be careful get, getting it over yes. my head. Oh, here, my dear. Try it on. But, oh, why are you giving me this, madame? In return, you will do me a small favor, girl, no? Oh, oh gladly. Bien. You will put on this dress, draw the mantilla over your face, go out to my car and drive to my hotel, the Nervenduk. There you will go directly to my room. No one will dream of stopping you. They will take you for Leocadi. The green dress will be your passport. When you reach my, my room, you will lock yourself in and admit no one. If they try to get in, you will scream. Uh, uh, can you scream? I, I don't know. Scream for me. Come on. Loud. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Just yell, button, if they try to get, get in. They will go away. They always do when I yell hard enough. Oh, you see, Estrell, it is the only way I end your life. By scaring them. So, when they hem me in, I scream my way out. Well, it is as good a way as any to exercise my, my high seas. But, but, Madame Lafacari, how long must I stay in your room? Do uh, not worry, child. Do not worry. Only until 5.30. Then you must bundle yourself up again and burst out of the room in a terrible temper. If anyone tries to stop up you, you scream like again. Then return here to me. Come, come, sir. It is very, very simple. Say we will do it. Well, all right. Good. Estrella, do you want any money? Yes, of course. How much do you want, madame? All, all of it. Here, Bertha. You must take this money as a gift from me. Oh, no, madame. It's it, too, too much. It, it is not enough. Here, here this, 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 this shade ring. ring. Take it. It is yours. Madame, I could... Do not argue, child. Tell me, may uh, what is your full name? That's a trembling, madame. You, you live with your parents? They're dead, madame. Oh, a, a husband then? No, no madame. Not even a sweetheart. Oh, that this is sad. But at least you have no one to tell you what you can do and what you cannot do every second of the day. I envy you that. And who knows? If all goes well this afternoon, maybe you can scream for me again someday. Uh, no, 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 run along. I think I'd better escort her out, madame. After all, that is what I would do for the great Leocadi. <laughs> of course. And remember, Bertha, to sweep through the crowd like a queen and scream like a fishwife. <laughs> Bertha 
was sensational. You should have seen her fighting her way to your car. Oh, good. And now I have two hours to be myself again. Oh, breathing spell. Estrelle, I've come to you for help. Yes, madame. I'm in danger. Oh, my dear. Deadly danger. I am in fear of death. Madame. Look, Estrelle, that tea table over there is set for two. You're expecting your fiancé, Kyla Braxton, aren't you? Why, yes, but how did you know? I made it my business to find out. I know his reputation as a brilliant lawyer. I had to get his help privately so that no one would know. That's why I came here, to see him. You're not angry, Mr. Strauss. You will help me. Of course, my dear, and so will Kyla. He says you're the greatest singer in the world. I suspect he thinks the most beautiful. Hmm. But what do you mean he do? Listen, Mr. I have an anonymous pursuer. Do you know what that means to a woman in my position? Why, no, I... It, it means that I'm pursued by a madman. I, I never see him. But always I feel his maniac's eyes staring at me. I'm always in public, on display, at his mercy. Every moment is a threat. He sends you letters. And every day. Every hour, almost. And that's not, not all. Already there have been two attempts on my life. Seeming accidents. But the police... No, no, never that. It would be a scandal. A Roman holiday for the crowd. Then what about your manager, Mr. Wolfbane? He must be used to this persecution of celebrities. Surely he could protect you. <laughs> Wolfbane? I'd be the last person I'd tell this to. Why, he'd turn it into columns of publicity for the newspapers. If a sensation arises, turn it into dollars. And advertise it to the world. That's Wolfbane, the bear trainer. No, no, anyone but him. I still don't see why you came to us. Because, my dear... I've sung to you both night after night. You recognized us in the opera house? Yes, always. You never miss one of my performances. They say there's something in my voice for lovers. You both make it true. And I hoped you might help me. We will, both of us. Carla will be here soon. I know he can help. But in the meantime, you need my help even more. I, I must get you something to put on. Oh, oh good heavens! Come on, Estrell, to display your genius. I, I must look my best for, for you, Mr. Braxton. Coming. Oh, hello, hello, hello. hello dear. I have the most wonderful surprise for you. A surprise? Well, well, what is it? Oh, over there, man, the big what, chair. He plays Kakadi. No. Well, no, it can't be. Well, really, Carla. I know Julia oh, Cardi's the most beautiful woman in the world, but seeing her ought to knock you speechless. That isn't the point. You must forgive me. For a moment, I couldn't believe my eyes. <laughs> I don't mind. It's a pretty compliment. Now, wait, madame. I have something to tell you. There has been an accident. Accident? What is it, Carla? Do you mean to say that you haven't heard what has just happened? No, we've been in this room for the past hour. Oh, well, madame, it's difficult to tell you. It's almost impossible, unbelievable. Your name is on everyone's lips. The whole town's alive with it. So? But why? Because... Because you're supposed to be dead. Murdered. <gasps> Carla, what are you talking about? I tell you, Estrella, streets in front of the Norman Duke Leah Cottage Hotel are blocked with people. I just came from there. Someone has been murdered in your apartment, madame. <gasps> Heaven forgive me. Bertha. Bertha? Bertha? But I tell you, the body has been identified as yours, Leah Cottage. Your gown, your ring. But the face... Crushed beyond recognition. The whole cornice over the door fell just as she entered your room. Bertha. Poor child. I sent her to death just as surely as if I myself had pronounced sentence. Who... Who is this Bertha? Oh, Carla, she was one of my girls. She wore Leocardi's gown. She took Leocardi's place so that she could have a little time here with you. With me? What do you want with me, madame? Help which I no longer need. I feared for my life. And now... Now it's Bertha who's been killed in my place. But why do we talk? I must go to her at once. No. No, wait, madame. You say your life was threatened. Well, now the murderer thinks you're dead. You must still let him think so. Leocardi, does anyone beside Estrell know you're here? No, Carla. Everyone saw Madame Leocardi leave, or so they believed. Good. Then you must remain here, in hiding, madame. For how long, Mr. Braxton? Well, I don't know. I'll have to see Parr. He'll tell us what to do. Parr? Who is this Parr? Well, he's deputy chief of the Homicide Bureau. He was there at the Norman Duke when I left. 
That's all right. He's a very good friend of mine. He thinks Carla's wonderful. Estrell, please. But Mr. Braxton and I cannot stay here. No, you can't. But for the present, until Parr tells you what to do, you'd better remain here. If it would help catch Bertha's murderer, madame, then for her sake, you owe her that. Yes. Yes, that's true. I do owe her that. Very well, Mr. Braxton. I'll give you 24 hours. Tomorrow night, Leo Cardi sings Manon. And Leo Cardi has never missed a performance. All right. It's a deal. Now, tell me everything you know. Everything. And then I'll go and see Parr. It's a good thing I found you here. Oh, hello, Carla. How'd you know I was here? Oh, I just followed my nose, Parr. You may have a nose for murder, but I have a nose for bloodhounds. Well, Carla, what's on your mind? Well, I've been retained by Leo Cotty. Oh, she was your client then. She is my client. Is? She has retained me in the matter of uh, her murder. So you too know it was murder, eh? Hmm. Did she retain you before or after? Well, both, in a manner of speaking. She came to me secretly at 4.30. Well, unfortunately, I wasn't there. It wasn't until 5.30 that we finally met. Yeah, she was presumably lying dead here at 4.35. I myself saw the body a few minutes later. There seems to have been some doubt in your mind about her identity. Hey, queer you should ask that. As a matter of fact, there was. I happened to know Leah Carter never carried money. She made a pose of abhorring it. No money was found in her stocking. Quite a considerable sum. Hmm. However, that dress our corpse was wearing rattled a bit. Quite a characteristic color. Gulfstream green, they called it. A mate told me it's history. But still, I wasn't convinced. That was shrewd of you, Parr. I don't wonder they say you have a nose for murder. You were right. Leah Cotty's very much alive. She's up at Estrell's now. So, you're concealing with intent to defraud the live person of a murdered woman. Oh, something like that. Well, what shall I do with her? Keep her there. Oh, that won't be easy. She's above discipline. I told her that great as she is, we're concerned with something greater. Catching the man capable of such a crime. Well, if necessary, I'd have kept her there by force. As an essential witness to her own murder? If you like. But she'll only give us 24 hours. Well, doesn't the little fool realize she's still in danger if she lets the murderer find out he's killed the wrong woman? Incidentally, <clears throat> who was the wrong woman? Oh, a model of Estrell's named uh, Bertha Tremblay. Leah Cotty sent her here in her place. There's nothing she won't do to avenge that poor girl. Yes, sir, yes, sir. By the way, what did Leah Carter come to see you about? She said she was in fear of losing her life. Mm. She told me she'd been receiving anonymous threatening letters. She has? Has she, has she told anyone about them? Mm, not a soul. She swore she'd mention them to no one until she told us. Well, that's Estrella and me. You're sure? Didn't she even tell Wolfbane, her manager? <laughs> Him least of all. She said he'd only use them for publicity purposes. Turn them into dollars. That was her expression. Good, good. Now, now we've got him. Uh, who? Wolfbane. He told me Leocardi had been receiving anonymous letters. If Leocardi told no one, how did Wolfbane know about them? Unless he sent them himself. But wait. You'll see for yourself. I'll call the desk. Oh, where, where's that dratted telephone? Oh, right here. Hello? Give me Mr. Wolfbane's apartment. Yep. Wolfbane? This is Pa. Could you run up here a minute? All at once, if you don't mind. You, you can. Hey, good, good. He's coming right up, Kyla. When he comes in, I want you to notice his self-satisfied smirk. I played the fool for him, and how he swallowed the bait. What was it Kipling said? The bleating of the kid annoys the tiger. Well, watch me bleat. <laughs> Ah, pa, prompt as usual. That's theatrical training for... Oh, I beg your pardon. You're not alone. Uh, well, Payne, I, I want you to meet Mr. Braxton, an old friend of mine. Braxton used to be assistant district attorney. He's over to help. I see. Very pleased to make your acquaintance, sir. Thank you. I was telling Braxton here about those anonymous letters you told me your card has been getting. How long has this been going on, Wolfgang? Oh, the past six weeks or so, I believe. Mm. Did you personally see any of these letters, Wolfbane? No. Leo Cotty told me about them. 
She was greatly upset by them, poor child. Uh, how were they delivered? Uh, by mail? No. I had the impression they were deposited in places where, um, presumably no one but she herself would find them. Good, good. Inside job, eh? That fits in, but uh, you're smiling, Wolfane. Don't you agree? Was I smiling? <laughs> It was a smile of admiration for your cleverness, my dear father. Oh, sir. Oh, you still say, do you, Wolfen, that the Ocardi was murdered? I haven't the slightest doubt of it. Well, I don't know now. Looks pretty much like an accident to me. <laughs> it was meant to look so. Well, what beats me is if it was murder, why didn't that cornice fall on one of those maids or someone? Why did it wait to fall till the Ocardi herself came in? Don't that look like an accident? Perhaps the murderer was clever, my dear Pa. Murders are never clever. So the police have soothed their vanity for a century. Yeah, but look here. We, we've gone over this place with a fine tooth comb. We didn't find hide nor hair of a weapon or any of those fancy gadgets you were spouting about. Not a trace. We have our laboratories, you know, Wolf Bank. Laboratories. <laughs> Would you like to see a really modern, well-equipped laboratory, Mr. Parr? Why, sure. Then you should visit mine sometime. Gosh, gosh, I'd, I'd like to. Where, where is it? On 10th Avenue. I frequently spend the night there. I shall do so tonight. Great, great. Shall we say, uh, 9 o'clock? It will be a pleasure. You will come alone? Oh, I reckon so. The rest of the boys wouldn't understand what was going on. <laughs> exactly. Till nine tonight, then, Mr. Parr. Oh. Pleasure of meeting you, Mr. Braxton. Well, Tyler, what did you make of it? A dangerous megalomaniac, Parr. I wouldn't go there alone if I were you. Uh, don't worry, Tyler. I won't be alone. The janitor of that building and the other attendants will be my men. You can count on that. Now, now, listen carefully. I've, I've got a job for you. I want you to bring Leo Cardi to Wolf Bane's studio tonight. Parr, have you gone out of your mind? Now, don't argue with me. But listen, I, 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 I want her dressed in a green dress, as near in color and design as the one she wore this afternoon. The spell can manage it somehow, and that's important. When you get there, have the superintendent let you in the flat above Wolf Bane's, and then you and Leo Cardi come down the fire escape. Have Leo Cardi hide in shadows, and I'll get Wolf Bane to put out most of the lights. When she hears me say... Don't you feel there's someone else in this room, Wolfbane? I want her to come out and walk slowly into the room. Is that clear? Yes, perfectly clear. Ah, good, good. Now off with you. And remember, Wolfbane Studio tonight at nine. On time, I see. Hey, good evening, Will Ben. <laughs> hey, you have uh, quite an establishment here. And would it uh, trouble you if there was a little less light? It, it hurts my eyes. But of course, Mr. Barr. Well, as you can see at heart, I'm a man of science. I spend 20000 a year in my laboratory here. Hmm. Chemistry? No. Physics and mechanics. And perhaps you can give me some ideas to the mechanism employed by the murder of Leo Carter. Oh, merely a trigger of some sort. Even a stupid murderer could devise that. Yeah, but this wasn't stupid. It waited for its victim. There was no one at hand to touch it off. We've satisfied ourselves as to that. <laughs> it's fortunate for you police that scientists as a class don't major in murder. They have so many facilities at hand, utterly incomprehensible to the average intelligence. By average intelligence, I suppose you mean the police. <laughs> I do. Ah, mm. uh, here, for instance, is a potential murderer. A photoelectric cell. Every man of science is tremendously interested in its possibilities. <laughs> Shall I show you how it works? By all means. You see, it discriminates. As to what? Anything you choose. And let me show you how it discriminates between, for instance, different shades of color. 
Green, let us say. I have here a number of cards, each a distinct shade of green. Now, when I run the cards through the beam, a number registers. So, J. Now, this one. Emerald. And these. Nile. Chartreuse. Olive. Moss. Always the same number registers for the same shade. You follow? Yes, 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 I see. It it connected electrically with those uh, counting machines. Yes. It could be connected as well to a stone crusher, a trip hammer, or a a mill wheel. Or a trigger that touched off a cornice. (laughs) You get the idea, Far. Perhaps when a woman wearing a dress of Gulfstream green passed under it. Exactly. Mind you, I don't say that is what happened, but it might. And you see how helpless the police would be pitted against a really learned murderer. The resulting crash would completely obliterate the device, destroy the evidence by its very operation. (laughs) You know, constructive murder is so much more interesting than emotional murder. The police are always baffled. Unless the murderer himself shows them how it was done, of course. Exactly. You speak, Wolfbane, of constructive murder and emotional murder. Wouldn't a man capable of this clever constructive murder be incapable of an emotional crime? Oh, no, my dear Pa, you're confusing method with motive. Obviously, his motive might be emotional. I don't agree. Well, take a purely hypothetical case. Imagine a man of superior intelligence who found a girl singing in a cheap burlesque show... An orchid in an ash can, so to speak. Suppose he'd taken her out of all that, given her tutors, trained her voice, sent her abroad, given her a completely new personality, and then... then brought her back to fame and fortune. Again, hypothetically, let us suppose this modern Pygmalion had offered his Galatea the final gift himself. And she'd laughed him to scorn. Conceivably, such a man, however brilliant of mind, might be moved emotionally to murder. Yes, 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 I suppose that's possible. But the point I'm making is that the method would be constructive and quite undetectable. Or if detectable, quite incapable of proof. Yes, there's something in what you say, Wolfbane, but coming back to your, this, this device, this electric eye... It... It could never go wrong. How could it? You've seen how it discriminates even between shades of one color. What then? What if the wrong woman were wearing Gulfstream green? Impossible. Gulfstream green was a unique shade. It had only just been blended. Ranel Frere had only received one bolt of the material. (laughs) Oddly enough, I have an enormous color card here in this drawer of that very shade. I'm sorry I can't show it to you. Why not? Because, my dear Mr. Parr, if I open this drawer, an electric eye between these two arms on the desk will fire that revolver you see fastened up there in the ventilator. Mm, Most ingenious. See, Mr. Parr, I didn't care to have you interfering with my affairs. But she still don't answer that last question of mine. Suppose the wrong woman was wearing that Gulfstream green. I've told you it would be impossible. There was only one gown of that color. And Leo Cardi was wearing that one, wasn't she, Wolfane? Yes, she was. But suppose, Wolfane, hypothetically, of course, Leo Cardi had changed gowns with another woman. Suppose it wasn't Leo Cardi who was wearing that Gulfstream green this afternoon. She wasn't? Ah. Huh. You think to trick me... Me, Wolfbane, with these childish games. Well, why are you nervous, Wolfbane? If you are, I'd advise you to take your hand off that dangerous drawer. You might pull it out. A reflex, you know. What did you mean, Pa, about Leo Caddy on that dress? Don't you feel there's someone else in this room? You're Wolfbane? crazy. Am I, Wolfbane? Suppose you look behind you. <gasps> Caddy! No! Oh, no! Either Leo Caddy or a ghost, Wolfbane. Get away from me! Get away from me! You cut it down! He killed himself. Yes. Poetic justice. He was caught in his own trap. The card in that drawer was Gulf's 
extreme green. And I thought he loved me. But instead, how he must have hated me. Oh, I wish I'd known. Uh, it's, it's better this way. We'd had a hard time proving his guilt. It was poetic justice. His own constructive cleverness has destroyed him. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case. One member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Next week, we're especially privileged to bring you G.K. Chesterton's monumental creation, the great detective priest, Father Brown. The story he'll tell is that world-famous masterpiece, The Oracle of the Dog, in which Father Brown reveals that, like Sir Francis, he also understands the unspoken language of all God's creatures. Tonight's detective was Police Deputy Parr, Frederick Irving Anderson's famous detective, played by Mark Smith. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast -coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adapted by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is Mutual. 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 Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's great detectives of fiction. Men Against Murder. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual turns the spotlight on one of the great figures of crime detection and brings you his most exciting case. Tonight, Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot, in the tragedy at Marsden Manor. Evening, Monsieur Poirot. I'd recognize you anywhere, I think, thanks to those magnificent mustachios of yours. Merci bien. They are very magnificent, no? They are indeed. But tell me, did they help you solve the tragedy at Marsden Manor? Uh, no. It was the little gray cells in the brain of the great Hercule Poirot that prevented this great miscarriage of justice in the death of Richard Malfavre of Marsden Manor. It all began in the little village of Marsden Lee, less than a hundred kilometers from London. Coming, coming. Yes, yes, what is it? Be you Dr. Bernard? Yes, I am. Come quick, the master's done for. You mean Mr. Maltravers of the manor? Aye, the master. The mistress, she says, fetch the doctor, she says. For there be no use. He's a dead one. I know he's a dead one when I see him. What was it, man? An accident? No, be no accident. I found him in the lower meadow, with the blood running out of his mouth. Be a stroke. A stroke? That's what it be. Well, hurry, man, hurry, man, let's go. Come, come, come now, Mrs. Meltravis. You must get hold of yourself. The Lord give it, and the Lord take it away. After all, we are all of us mortal. But... But why, Richard? He was so good, so kind. Why did this have to happen to him? Oh, come, come, please. He seemed so well, so full of life. Why, only last week he passed a medical examination for insurance. How could he have died so suddenly? Doctor, what happened? The hemorrhage due to stomach ulcers, undoubtedly, resulting in a stroke. <laughs> Right. Hello, Farrow. You know my good friend, Captain Hastings, no? Good morning, Captain Hastings. Good morning, sir. Well, Farrow, you got my message, I see. I did. What is it that disturbs you, mon ami? Oh, it should matter. Guys, you sent for Poirot. 
What was the cause of Monsieur Malfavre's death? The death certificate says a hemorrhage resulting in a stroke due to stomach ulcers. But surely you did not bring Papa Poirot here to talk of the stomach ulcers. Is Richard Malfavre's had taken out the insurance policy in your company, no? And what a policy. For 50,000 pounds. Well, good square sum, that, huh? Hmm. Rather. So, what is it you wish me to do? It is unfortunate for your company, but everything seems, uh, how you say, uh, open and above the plank, no? <laughs> no, Poirot. Open and above board. Ah, my good friend, the great tastings. Always he corrects the English of a super. <laughs> Monsieur Wright, I ask you, do I not speak the English of a, of a super? <laughs> you do indeed. But to get back to your previous question, what my company wishes you to do is to investigate the circumstances of Mr. Maltravers' death. So... What is it you suspect, mon ami? Well, of course, you know, in the case of suicide, the policy is invalid. Yes. And when a man past the prime of life takes out an unusually large policy in favor of a young wife half his age and then dies within two weeks, the possibility of suicide cannot be ignored. Oh, with certainty, mon ami. But suicide by hemorrhage? That is a queer suspense of fish. Now, if the cause of death had been our failure, ah, then I would smell a mouse. Our failure can always mean that a, a stupid doctor did not find the true cause. But hemorrhage, ma foi, hemorrhage is, well, the, the, the uh, hemorrhage. Exactly. <laughs> Nevertheless, we are determined to proceed with the matter. You will undertake the inquiry? But of course. Hastings, that great professor of English, shall go with me. <laughs> hey, mon ami? <laughs> Gladly, for Eh bien. Now, where is this place, this Marsden Manor? You take the Great Eastern Line from Liverpool Station to the little town of Marsden Lee. Marsden Manor is about a mile from the village. Mm, Marsden Lee. All right, Hastings, we go. Marsden Lee, eh? I hope we can get a conveyance up to the manor. Ticket, ticket, sir. Ah, uh, here you are, my friend. I suppose you'll be coming down for the funeral, sir. Funeral? Uh, what funeral? Uh, you say you've made the funeral of Master Maltravers. About oh. the manor. Oh, uh, you say the manor. Uh, could that be Marsden Manor? Aye, it be. That is an odd coincidence. Uh, my friend and I, we have come down with a thought of uh, buying this Marsden Manor. You couldn't pay me to live there, you couldn't? Why not? It'd be haunted. Haunted? I haunted. Seen things there, folks says. Yeah, we should see. Now, could you tell us where a Dr. Bernard lives? I, up yon hill, about half a mile. There. Uh, Jeremy Stinks. <laughs> Dr. Bernard, that you signed the death certificate of a Mr. Richard Maltravel. Yes, I did. You understand, Doctor, with such a big policy, we must make the careful investigation. Of course, of course. I suppose he was such a rich man, his life was insured for a big sum. Hmm? You consider him a rich man, Doctor? Well, was he not? He kept two cars, you know, and Marsden Manor is a pretty big place to keep up. Mm. Although I believe he bought it very cheaply. I understand he had had uh, considerable losses of late. Mm, is that so? Indeed. Mm. It's fortunate for his widow, then, that there is this insurance. Yes, yes. Very beautiful and charming young creature, but terribly unstrung by this sad catastrophe. I've tried to spare her all I could, but of course the shock has been very great. Why shock? These ulcers of the stomach, uh, they are what uh, you call chronic, yes, eh? yes. They are not sudden. No. Did you not attend uh, Mr. Maltravers before, Doctor? My dear sir, I never attended him. What? I understand Mr. Maltravers was a member of a fake healing sect. But you examined the body? Certainly. I was fetched by one of the under gardeners. And the cause of death was clear? Absolutely. There was blood on the lips, but most of the bleeding must have been internal. He had not been moved? No. No, the body hadn't been touched. He had evidently been out shooting crows and a long-barreled bird gun lay beside him. The hemorrhage must have occurred quite suddenly. 
gastric ulcers, without a doubt. He could not have been shot, huh? My dear sir, I beg pardon. But I remember once a doctor who said heart failure until the constable showed him a bullet wound through the head. Mm, you mm. will find no bullet wounds on the body or head of Mr. Maltravers. Now, gentlemen, if there's nothing further, uh, I... Thank you, doctor. Uh, uh, just one more thing. You saw no need for the autopsy, huh? Certainly not. The cause of death was perfectly clear. In my profession, we see no need to distress unduly the relatives of a dead patient. Now, gentlemen, if you'll pardon me, good day. Well, Hastings, what do you think of our good Dr. Bernal? <laughs> Bit of an old fool. Precisely. Your judgments of character are always profound, mon ami. Except where a young and beautiful woman is concerned. So now you must uh, mind your cues and peas. Because the good doctor has said that the next one we see is both young and beautiful. This Madame Maltravers. Madame Maltravers, I cannot tell you how I am sorry to bother you in this way. Must I be bothered now? I know nothing about this insurance of my husband. Courage, Madame. It is necessary. I will do all to make this matter not too unpleasant for you. I, Arthur Poirot, swear it. Now, if you would recount briefly the sad events of last Wednesday, huh? Well, I was changing for tea when the maid came up. One of the gardeners had just run up to the house. He found Richard. No, oh, I can't for you. Enough. <laughs> you had seen your husband earlier in the afternoon? No, not since lunch. I walked down to the village with his tent. I believe he was out pottering around the ground. Uh, shooting the crows, no? Yes, so I understand. He usually took his bird gun with him. In fact, I heard one or two shots at a distance. So? Oh. Where is this bird gun now? I, in the gun cabinet over there, I suppose. With your permission, madame. Yeah, here it is. Ah. Two shots fired, I see. And now, madame, a delicate question. Monsieur Maltravers, your husband, is awaiting burial, I believe. Yes. He's lying in his room. Uh, if I might see? Why, yes, of course. It's the, the first room at the top of the stairs. You'll forgive me if I don't go with you. What of course. Hastings, you're a many old madame. Do you think Mr. Poirot will understand why I didn't go with him? Oh, I can assure you, Mrs. Maltravers, Poirot is most sympathetic. I don't doubt it, Mr. Hastings. I only wish there was more that I could tell him. Oh, I understand. And I wonder, Mrs. Maltravers, if you could tell me one thing. Oh, well, yes? Well, the station master, or an odd character named Volk, said something about Marsden Manor being haunted. Marsden Manor haunted? Why, surely you're joking, Mr. Hastings. Oh, no, no, I assure you. He told us that people have seen things. We must have been referring to my, my humble experiments in extrasensory perceptions. I've always been tremendously intrigued by that subject. And doubtless some of our servants have been gossiping. Madame, you are mediumistic. How fascinating. Oh, I wouldn't go so far as to say that, Mr. Poirot. I've dabbled a bit, that's all. So? I've managed uh, table levitation and simple things like that. Hmm. But I suppose to the simple rustics around here, it looks like black magic. Very interesting. Under kinder circumstances, I would implore a demonstration. Why, are you interested in such things, Mr. Poirot? All fields of knowledge interest the great Poirot. Uh, Poirot, don't you think perhaps we'd better... Oh, I forgot, madame. Uh, I thank you for your so great courtesy. I do not think you need be bothered any further by the matter. Uh, by the way, do you know anything of your husband's financial position? Nothing, whatever, I'm afraid. I'm very stupid about business. I see. Then you can give us no clue as to why your husband suddenly decided to insure his life. Oh, was it sudden? I'm sure I don't know. En fait. And now, with your permission, madame, we will go. They think? Oh, uh, I'll see you to the door. Merci. Oh, uh, just one more thing, madame. Could you tell me, when they found Mr. Maltravers, did they find him unshod uh, without the shoes? Really, Mr. Poirot, I, I don't understand. <laughs> it is nothing. It does not matter. And now, madame, adieu. Oh, but look, you have another visitor. Someone is coming up to walk, huh? Archie, Hello, you! 
Why, I, I thought you were on your way back to Australia. Yes, I was. But I read the news of Uncle's death in Paris and hurried back. Emily, my dear, is there anything I can do for you? Anything. Oh, of course not. What could you do? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm forgetting. Uh, Mr. Poirot, this is Captain Black, my husband's nephew. Uh, Captain Black, Mr. Hastings. How uh, down? Emily, how did this happen? Uncle seemed perfectly well when I was here Monday night. You've evidently read the papers, Archie. You must know what happened. But they gave no details, just the bare notice of his death. What happened? Archie, I... I just can't go through all that again. Yes, Captain Black, I'm afraid my friend and I... We have disturbed, madame. What are you doing here? I am Hercule Poirot. The Hercule Poirot. Uh, Mr. Poirot is from the insurance company, Archie. That's just why I've come back. To protect you from annoyances like this. You shouldn't have risked your job, Archie. If you left right away, you might still get to Paris in time to make your boat train. Uh, You say Paris, mon capitaine. You go to Australia by way of Paris? Why, yes. I intended taking the Orient Express from there and pick up the Pacific Mail at Port Said. Ah, oui. That shortens the journey, does it not? You are staying here, Captain Black? Yes, I'm staying at the Pig and Thistle. That's the inn down in the village. Ah, village inn. It serves the roast beef, no? Why, yes, I suppose so. Good. So, Hastings, let us try this roast beef at the Pig and Thistle, huh? All right, Poirot, now you've had your roast beef. Hadn't we better be getting back to London? No, not so fast, my good Hastings. London, she will not run away. But this Captain Black, he may do so. A garçon, garçon. For heaven's sake, Poirot. English inns don't have garçon. No? Then who is it who approaches? Yes. What do you have, Governor? For my friend, the dictionary. For me, a, a, a buck. <laughs> he means beer, George. I mean the ale. Right, oh, Governor. Uh, you've been up at the manor, sir? I. I mean, yes, we have. It's sad business, that. I knew no good had come of it as soon as they took the man. Eh? Uh, you mean this, uh, Maltravers? Uh, they were not popular? Well, uh, not that, Governor. He was a bit too old for her, if you know what I mean. Oh, hmm? She might better have married the nephew. At least, ways so. I'll bet a bob the nephew thought. So. Ah, there has been the gossip, huh? Eh? Well, I wouldn't go so far as that, Governor. But he did hang around a bit. And the husband, uh, Mr. Maltravers? He object? Not as I knows of, Gaffney. But why is my opinion, I ain't. Mm. Without the doubt, it is the worst opinion, no, George? But, ah, the Captain Black, here he comes now. Hello, Poro, here you are. Oh, Captain Black, <laughs> come, will you not join us? <laughs> Bark, perhaps? Yeah, thanks, I don't mind if I do. Wait a mug of ale. Oh, hello, Gaffney. Sad business, this. Death of your uncle, huh? Yes. And so sudden, too. He seemed in excellent health when I dined with him Monday night. So? And was he also in good spirits? What did he say? Or what was the talk at the dinner Monday night? Oh, I don't know. The usual general topics. I see. My uncle asked about my people. We talked of Australia. Yes. Then Mrs. Maltravers asked a lot of questions about East Africa, where I've spent some time. I told them one or two yarns. That's about all, I think. Madame Maltravers uh, seems much upset at the death of her husband, no? Naturally. They've been married less than a year. So I hear. A remarkable woman, this lady. Remarkable in what way? What do you mean? She has, uh, how you say, the seeing eye. I hear her tell Hastings. She does the seance. Uh, he seems most interested, no, Hastings? Oh, I, I wouldn't go so far as that. Uh, always the conservative Hastings. Me? I am not so. Well, Mr. Poirot, don't tell me you believe in this psychic stuff. Oh, I have not the closed mind. For example, Captain Black, you have told us all that your conscious self knows. Now, with your permission, I would question your subconscious, huh? Psychoanalysis, eh? Well, it's nonsense, but I don't mind. Merci. It is like this. I give you a word. You answer with another word. Any word. The first word you think of. Eh bien. Shall we begin? Go ahead. Hey, things. Note yeah. down the words, please. Very well, Paul. Now. Day. Night. Name. Place. Bernard. Shore. Monday. Dinner. Journey. Ship. Country. 
Uganda. Story. Lions. Third gun. Fun. Shot. Suicide. Elephant. Tusks. Money. Lawyers. So, that is all. You are a good subject, mon capitaine. You don't mean to tell me that rigmarole means anything to you. Maybe not. But nevertheless, you are a good subject. <laughs> well, if you don't need me anymore, I think I'll go upstairs and unpack. Shall I see you again before you leave, Mr. Poirot? Yes, I should not be surprised. Good. See you later. Au revoir, mon capitaine. And now, my clever Christies, you see it or no? Oh, I don't know what you mean, Poirot. Does that list of words tell you nothing? Sorry, I'm afraid it doesn't. Then I will assist you. To begin with, the capitaine answered within the time limit. No pauses, no making up the mind. Yeah. Day to night and place to name are normal associations. Then I give him Bernard, the name of the doctor, if he knew him. Oh. Evidently, he does not. When I say Bernard, he says sure. Monday means dinner, country is Uganda. Story recalls the lion story, he tells them. All uh, natural. But now, notice. When I mention bird gun, I get the unexpected answer, farm. When I say shot, he answers at once, suicide. A man he knows commits suicide with a bird gun on a farm somewhere. <coughs> Imbecile that I am! The great Hercule uh, Poirot is... Is Udwin. What are you talking about? Do you not see his things? That is the story the Captain Black told at the dinner Monday night. Oh, I see. And you think that gave Maltravers the idea? You think he shot himself in the mouth with that bird gun? Why not? Remember, the bird gun has a very tiny charge of powder. The bullet would remain lodged in the brain. All that would show would be the blood in the mouth. Come, his things. It is not too late. Of course, but, but where? To see once more this dead man, to Marsden Manor. Hastings, to Marsden Manor. Alas, Mrs. Maltravers, it is true. Your husband shot himself through the mouth with the bird gun. You mean suicide? It would seem so, madame. But... The insurance. Naturally, madame, this suicide will void the policy. It is unfortunate, but <laughs> what will you? Oh, but this is impossible. My husband would never commit suicide. It's, it's inconceivable. But the evidence, madame, it is conclusive. No, there must be some other explanation. You mean uh, murder, madame? Well, of course, that is always possible. But no, no, not likely, I'm afraid. But you do admit it's possible. You just said it was possible. Yes, of course, everything is possible. Have you any idea who might have wished to kill your husband? Why, no. No, I haven't. Madame, I have a suggestion. It is bizarre, no doubt, but perhaps if you are willing to help. Oh, yes, yes, of course, anything. Madame, you are mediumistic. Perhaps if you would try... Perhaps you could... you're right. Perhaps I could get through to Richard. He might tell us what happened. I am sure you could do it, madame. Yes, yes, I'll do it. Uh, come back here tonight at eight and bring Captain Black with you. Eh bien, madame, I am sure you will succeed. Until eight, madame, au revoir. Mr. 
Madame Bovels, we are on time, as you see. Hastings and I have brought Captain Black with us. I say the, the bad storm coming up, would that interfere with the experiment? Certainly not, Mr. Hastings. This isn't mumbo jumbo. The weather has nothing to do with it. Well, well. Let us proceed, huh? Uh, yes, yes. Now, uh, will you draw chairs up around this table, please? Oh, yes. oh. Uh, now, Mr. Hastings, if you will put out the lights. Certainly. Now, remain perfectly quiet, please. No matter what you hear or see. Richard. Richard. Can you hear me, Richard? Can you hear me? If you can, rap. Rap three times. Did you hear that? Ah, but of course, madame. Did you not tell him to rap three times? That's how Richard always used to knock. Perhaps he is outside. No. They say the suicide never rests, always returns. Listen. What was that? The front door slammed. Oh, no, Captain Black. It was but the thunder. Listen. Where are I? I hear footsteps. It is the wind, madame. I will close the door. Ah, I have locked it. Uh, don't do that. If it should open now. Ah! I hope it is open. He's there. There in the doorway. I see nothing, madame. I saw him, I tell you. My husband, you must have seen him too. Look. She's right. He is there. His hand. Look, it's pointing. What's that light coming from? It's pointing at her. What did you... Her hand. Her right hand. It is scarlet with blood. Blood! Yes, it's blood! I killed him! I did him! Take her away! Take her away! Light! Good heavens, Poirot. Oh, she's got away through that window. Do not worry, mon capitaine. The good inspector Jap outside will stop her. Good heavens, that, that lovely creature, a murderer. And a very clever one, my susceptible Hastings. After all, she could not know she would come up against the great Hercule Poirot. And she might even have fooled me if she had only taken off his shoe. His shoe, Poirot? Only with his toe could he himself have pulled the trigger of this bird gun. And par bleu... His shoes were still on when they found him. But I don't understand. This seance, was it all fake? Mr. certain no. She meant to pull the sheep. Ah, wool. Oh, very well, wool. But it was I who pulled the sheep's wool over her eyes. Thanks to my good friend Henri Dubois, who played the part of the husband's ghost, and Papa Poirot, who put the red paint on her hand in the dark. But what was her idea in having this seance? Parable, oh, mon capitaine. Do you not see? Madame, she will go into the trance. She will hear the voice. She will come out from the trance. She will, with the great reluctance, name the murderer. You mean she meant to confess? Mais no, mon capitaine. She meant to name you. <laughs> You have been listening to Murder Clinic. Murder Clinic, the WOR Mutual Series, which brings to you each week one exciting case. Tonight, the tragedy of Marsden Manor, with Agatha Christie's unique detective, Hercule Poirot. Played by Maurice Totlam. Next week, Murder Clinic will bring you Fred Irving Anderson's Deputy Farr, the Vermont farmer who became chief of the Homicide Bureau in New York City. Deputy Farr, the man with the nose for murder. The story is Gulf Stream Green, in which the deputy proves that conceit of murderers is colossal. <laughs> Original music 
music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. This program was an international exchange feature over the coast-to-coast network of the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Tales told on Murder Clinic are adaptations by authors Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. Frank Knight speaking. This is Mutual. Is Mutual. Is Mutual. Is Mutual. Murder Clinic. Stories of the world's great detective. Men against murder. The company of the great detectives is small, but their exploits are unique. Each week, WOR Mutual invites you to meet one member of this select band, one great detective in his most exciting case. The curtains part in our amphitheater of mystery. It's dark except for one brilliant spotlight. And out of the shadows steps Professor Henry Poggioli, Ph.D. The professor is a smallish, dark-eyed gentleman with spectacles and slightly pedantic in manner. Good evening, Professor. Good evening, Mr. Knight. You're a psychologist, aren't you, Professor? Yes, of course. But my experience in crime is purely incidental, and yet, wherever I go, I find myself involved in some strange mystery. Well, that's very interesting and intriguing. And what particular case is on your mind tonight, Professor? I think I'll tell you the story of my most famous case, the one that gained me my greatest reputation. It was written by T.S. Stribling and called The Governor of Cap Asia. <laughs> I had taken a year's sabbatical from Ohio University, where I teach, and I was traveling through the Caribbean. Our cruise ship sailed into the harbor of Haiti on a glorious morning. I, I was on deck, of course. In the chair next to me was an American who had joined the cruise at last port, a representative of that go-getter type so common to our country. That morning, for the first time, well, Professor, we'll be docking, son. You know, I'll bet dollars to donuts the Marines will be recalled here in Haiti within six months. The Marines recalled? I, yeah. I didn't know they'd ever been sent away, Mr. Uh, 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 Waterman's the name. Henry yes. Clay yes. Waterman. Insurance is my racket. That's why I'm down here. Going to close our offices in Cap Hashian and Port-au-Prince. Cancel all outstanding policies. We're through. Finished. Finny! Uh, that sounds rather drastic, Mr. Waterman. Yeah, that's the right word for it, Professor. Drastic. <clears throat> we, uh, we insurance boys are pretty wise birds, brother. And that's what we think about the future of the Black Republic. Indeed? Yeah. Things have been getting steadily worse ever since the Marines packed up. This new Governor Boisran took over. He, he's a native. Pure-blooded caco. No property safe here anymore. My company's been paying out and paying out. Did you say Boisland? That's, that's very yeah. interesting, Mr. Waterman. I have a cable gam which I received several days ago. Perhaps perhaps you could throw some light on it. Uh, see. Here it is. Mm. <clears throat> Professor Henry Pagioli, you are a corresponding member of the American Society for Psychological Research... Report at once to Aristide Boisran at Capacian. Fees no object. Signed, Dr. Vauquer, Minister, Department of Health. I uh, wonder what those two crooks want with you. Crooks? Surest thing you know. I've had dealings with both of them. Boisran's a big bear of a man. Self-made. Gotta admire him somehow. Vauquer's a half-breed. Part French. Been an actor, I believe. Studied medicine abroad. Now he's Minister of Health. Boisran's right-hand man. But, but you said they were crooks. Well, I put it up to you as one man to another. <laughs> we kept uh, getting claims for plantations destroyed. When we complained to Boisran, he shrugs and says, what can he do? 
says a cactus leader up in the hills, does it? If you ask me, there ain't no such bird. Or if there is, his name's Wazron. I see, or rather, I will see. If I was you, Professor, uh, <clears throat> I wouldn't step off this ship. That place ain't safe. You mean there's danger? Yeah. But you're landing on Oh, you? well, that's different, Professor. <laughs> I'm out for business. You're just out for science. <laughs> yes, that's right, Mr. Waterman. I'm just out for science. It's strange what a man will do just for science. <laughs> It is uh, Professor Pojoli I'm addressing, n'est-ce pas? Yes, I am Professor Pojoli. Ah, evidently you received my cable, monsieur. Uh, allow me to present myself. I'm Dr. Vauquier, Minister of Health. How do you do, sir? Oh, so sorry you were annoyed by these ragamuffins, Professor. The hand of our government is too lax, I'm afraid. A recent change in policing, you understand. Ah, but I must not keep you out here in this heat. Uh, have you presented your bags at customs yet? Uh, no, no, not yet. Uh, I'll run right over and oh, do it now. No, 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 please, Professor. Do not walk. Come. I will drive you, monsieur. You have beautiful country, Dr. Vauquer. That magnificent marketplace, the color, the native artwork. And yet, monsieur, already our native racial development is in danger of being completely wiped out and replaced by routine American civilization. Like, like those empty tin oil cans our women now carry on their heads instead of the hand-woven baskets of their ancestors. What we call progress, Dr. Vauquer. But it's all in the laps of the gods. Individuals can do nothing in the major trend of racial developments. That is where I disagree, Professor. In fact, it is precisely why you are here in Haiti today. I... Surely you're joking. No, not at all, monsieur. My country stands today at a crossroads. American authority has been withdrawn. We have our native government. Can we keep it so? But what have I to do with that, doctor? You will see, monsieur. Our hills are full of insurrectionary bands called cacos. These rebel leaders keep a hold over our people through superstition. Our people call them papalois. They follow them, obey them, and so rebel against the organized government. If I would like to help Dr. Vauquer, oh, but I, I can't imagine a man having, one man especially having an effect on an old folk belief, such as voodooism. The problem is not so wide, monsieur. It is individual. There is right now one Kako's leader who calls himself Jean Lafonde. If you could explain the seemingly magical effects he produces, unmask him as a faker, that would break his hold on our people and make them good citizens of Governor Boisron. You must be very devoted to Boisron, Doctor. Devoted? That is not quite the right word, Monsieur. He is remarkable. A native. In fact, he was once himself a Kako's leader. And so powerful a one that the authorities of Port-au-Prince had to recognize his authority and make him governor. I see. An interesting road to political preferment. And now he needs help to hold his position. But what about his friends here? You, for example. Friends? <laughs> Men like Aristide Boisron do not have friends, monsieur. They are followers, admirers, psychophants. But surely there is at least one who loves him. You are a sentimentalist, monsieur. Like all Americans. But in this case, you're right. There is one who loves Boisron, who would die for him. His dog, Lubu. And you, Dr. Vauquer, are a cynic like most Frenchmen. I'm right, am I not? You are French. Uh, part French, part Asian, monsieur. Uh, but I have been educated in Paris and uh, lived there most of my life. Indeed, Doctor. This experience of yours with a man like Boisron's stamp must be fascinating. That is the word, monsieur. Fascinating. Ah, but here, you shall see for yourself. Here is the gate to the governor's mansion. Ah, oh dear. It is you at last. 
And this, this I take it is Professor Poggioli. Come in, Professor. Come in. The professor is charmed with eighty, Monsieur le Governor. We've had a most interesting discussion on racial Stop development. Stop wasting time, Vauquier. Monsieur Poggioli, no doubt, is in a hurry. <coughs> down, <coughs> down, <coughs> down, <coughs> down, <coughs> mon beau chien. Qu'est-ce que avez vous mon ami? Bien, good dog. Now, you have told him, Vauquier. He has told you what I want of you, Professor. About this carcass leader? Yes, Governor Boisson. And one thing is very strange. Why do you need me? Why don't you go up into the hills and, and eliminate this Jean Lafranc? Because I cannot get at him, Monsieur Pujoli. Move against him where I will. He reads my mind. And he's not there. It is like, like chasing jack-o'-lantern. He knows where I will strike before I touch my sword. You don't mean he actually reads your thoughts? But of course, he is voodoo, monsieur. If he could not read my mind, I would catch him at once with my ruralis, shoot him on sight. I know the mountains as well as Lafron. I can fight better than he can. But, monsieur, he is Papa Loire. No one can do anything against him. You say no one, Governor. You've sent others? Fabio, monsieur, I have sent many spies to his camp. They pretend to be deserters from my ruralis. And so they get there. And what happens? Écoutez-vous. Mon Dieu. Wait. You shall see for yourself. These are the latest spies I sent to La Saint Saint-Jean, Felipe, bien. Good heavens. Look at their heads. Their ears. They've cut off. They always come back so, monsieur. C'est toi. Quiet. Saint-Jean, Felipe, bien. We will question you. You will answer. Now, Monsieur Pozzoli, see what you can learn. Your name is Saint Jean. Uh, oui, Monsieur. You went to the Cacus camp as a spy. Uh, oui, Monsieur. Quiet at night like a snake, Monsieur. No one knew I. And when did you arrive? Sun up, Excellency. You didn't go alone, Saint Jean. Mm, no, Monsieur. These others, they went with me. They too were spies. I... <laughs> the deserters, they did not come back. You saw this leader, yeah. this this Jean uh, Lafon. Oui, we, Excellency. He's Papa Louis, a great tall. All man with a knife stuck through his arm. Oh, come, come, Saint Jean. No man can live with a knife stuck through his arm. <laughs> oh, but he is Papa Louis, Excellency. With my own eyes, I saw the knife. The point came out so much on the back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Saint Jean, you saw the knife. Then what did he do? We walked to him through many cacos. Then he took a drop of our blood and swallowed it. That gave him power over us. Yes, yes. Then what happened? Then he cut off my ears and sent me back. Yes, but but what about the other men, the true deserters? Did he cut off their ears? But no, Excellency. When their blood reached his heart, he knew they were true cacos. And he knew I was a spy. Listen, Saint Jean. When did this Papa Loire know you were a spy? When my drop of blood. Oh, never reached... mind your drop of blood. Forget I... that. When did he come up to you and say, Saint Jean, you are a spy? I am going to cut off your ears. Never, never. He did not speak. He did not cut them off. He just wished them off. He is Papa Loire. Oh, never mind that, Saint Jean. <laughs> Just tell me what happened after the blood... Me and the guard went to a jaguar, a little house. He left me by myself. I sat down, then my ears fell off, and I went home. I see. (laughs) Uh, Now, now tell me, Saint-Jean, what time was it when you left the cackle camp? The sun was straight up, Excellency. About noon? Oui, monsieur. Then look, Saint-Jean. You reached this camp at sunrise. You left it at noon. You must have stayed there for six hours. What did you do in that time? No, 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 I did not stay. I went away at once. You see, you see, Boisron, the man is lying or something from the the illusions. He admits that he spent six hours in the camp. I saw him do it. He is Papa Loire. Enough, enough, Allez, Take them away. You, Vauquier. Go with them. Spread the word that Monsieur Pozzoli, the great American voodoo inspector, will go to Jean Lefranc's camp to see 
If he is a real Papa Loire. This is ridiculous, Boisron. I'm no voodoo doctor going around making charms. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> you are brave, monsieur, to be angry with me. You will be brave enough to go to this Kako's camp. He will be expecting you. You mean you actually think that message will reach La France? Capacia, monsieur, is like a spider's web. Touch one thread... And it all quivers. Yes, but look here. I can't possibly go to this Lafrance camp without a guide. He will have men posted to watch out for you. Yes, but he can't allow me in his camp, a psychologist, coming with the avowed purpose of exposing his tricks. If he does not, monsieur, every Negro on the island will say at once, he is no to Papa Loire. He would not dare refuse you admittance. Suppose he tried to cut off my ears to show his power. You hear? <laughs> <laughs> that way. Do you hesitate to risk your ears for science? You will see what no white man has seen before. There's no use in my going. The mystery is how he can pick out the spies from the true deserters. If I go to his camp alone... I have thought of that, monsieur. I shall select two men to go with you. A genuine spy and a genuine deserter. You can see what happens to both of them. You have two such men? Not really, monsieur. I have chosen the spy. A deserter can be picked up any place along the road. The spy. Can you trust him? <laughs> With my life, monsieur. Nor will he be afraid of Jean Lefranc. This is one man of whom you need have no doubt. Very well. I'll do it. When do we leave? Tonight. Two hours after midnight. You will find a carriage waiting outside this gate. Take it. The driver has his orders. Now, you had better sleep, monsieur. It may be long before you sleep again. Monsieur. Monsieur. Hey? Eh? What? Who are you? Monsieur, it is two o'clock. The carriage. She wait for you. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, very well. Oh, here you are. You are waiting for me? Oui, monsieur. Are you alone? Is no one to go with us? Don't know, monsieur. Oh, that's strange. Well, let's go. Driver, weren't you supposed to stop somewhere and pick up another man? I do not know, monsieur. I was told to pick up white man at governor's house, drive him 11 kilometers out on Wamente Road. That is all I know, monsieur. Here is the place, monsieur. There must be some mistake. It's... It's black as pitch. No, no, no mistake, monsieur. This is the place. Hey, men come. I go, I go. White man, I smell white man. Are you the boys who are going to take me to Jean Lafrance camp? No, 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 no. I want to go to the Carcos camp. I am the, the voodoo inspector. White man. We go Kakos camp. You come along with us. We've been walking a long way. How far are we from La France, Captain? Hush, hush, white man. Save you breath for climbing. We go up into mountains. Who goes up? Voodoo Inspector. You gotta climb. Great heavens! I can never climb that. Why, it's it's thirty feet of sheer stone cliff. You will climb. I go first. No, no, I, I can't do it. Here, take my hand. I lift you. Uh, uh, strong fellow. Hey, look at that. Who does that? Who does that? Go Bozan, you, you are mad to risk this. Quiet. Save you, Bert. We're almost there Careful. now. Careful. Uh, oh, what, Monsieur? Monsieur. Oh, Careful. Ah. Hey, we're on top. 
Oh, you hear that, Professor? Voodoo drums. We are almost there. I am sorry you recognize me. But, well, now listen quickly. We may be separated. First, tell me, why didn't you drive out with me? I walk. It was better so. Barefooted? Your feet must be torn to ribbons. You forget, Pozzioli. I am a cacos. Yes, but... Never mind that now. Listen to me. Whatever happens, do not interfere. Do you understand? But suppose Lafranc recognizes you, too. He will recognize me. I know that. But then... Quiet! Someone is coming. You! Voodoo Inspector! Uh, yes. Over there, deserters. You come with me. Look, there's the altar, the flame. What a crowd. There must be hundreds. My men, deserters, all of them, they will pay for this. But where is the problem? Wait. There. Right through the flame. Clever devil, that. Professor, how, how does he do that? It's a theatrical trick. Illusion, they call it. I'd have to examine it more closely to discover how it works. By Jove. The frown wearing a, a red mask. It covers his whole head. Yes, yes. No one has ever seen his face. Watch. Watch. There, there goes the first of our men. You see? At the altar. Lafron picks his arm with a knife. Look. Now, he's soaking the blood. Now, now I, I am next. Watch. See where they take me after. No, no, Boisla. No, he will kill you. Come, run, run for your life. You are easily frightened, monsieur. No, I have waited many moons for this chance. See, he beckons me. Adieu. I go. Where did they take my friend, the big giant black man who came with me? Don't know, master. Don't know. Don't know. Don't know. You, you old woman, where is the place they keep the new men? You do not know, monsieur. The devil does very little for you. Oh, hang the devil. Where is this man? Mm, I see big man, monsieur, sitting in an old chair. Papa Loire. He speak with him. The big man fights. His heart rages like great fire. He can do nothing. Nothing. He is like great drunk bear. Now, I... <laughs> Your big friend wears flowers on his head. They bloom like red roses. Good heaven, Bordra. They've got him. Tell me, you old she-devil, where is he? In one of the jaguars. Go, voodoo inspector. Put the ears back on his head. <laughs> What's Good in Thank my God dear. I found you. What have they done to you? Medicine. Dog. I fight. Here. Bottle. So oh. that's it. Scopa, tell him. That's how he got the truth out of those spies, poor devils. They never had a chance. The drug removes all the inhibitions, makes them tell the truth. But... But now they must know who you are. You must get out of here. No. You wait. He have his chance. My turn soon. Oh, that's right, fire. The Rodales. My Rodales. Let me out. Let me out. Arsla, that man behind you, he has a knife. A balois. At last, my two hands are on your neck, you bullet of your dog. Companion, a shot at the Zola Zumania, I jump. Stop. Get up, man. He's. he's dead. Monsieur, they did a good job, my little Alice, eh? Yes, very thorough. But how did your troops ever manage to find their way here? Mm, it was Lobo. Lobo? Oui, monsieur, my dog, my faithful Lobo. 
I knew if I could once march into this Kakus camp barefooted, the Obu would follow me and lead my men to Jean Lefranc. You still call him Jean Lefranc? Why? Didn't you know? Know what, monsieur? That he was Papalwa? And that I... I killed him with my bare hands. Then you haven't looked under the, under the devil's mask he wore? Mask? Pablo? No, monsieur, no. And yet, you almost guessed. They told me he had been an actor in France. I, I was sure of it later when I talked to Saint-Jean. Those last six hours of his smacked too strongly of scopothalamine. Not a native drug, but a European one. A European doctor, a European actor, and a member of your own household. Oui, monsieur. Jean Lefranc, Papa Loire, was Dr. Vaquier. Well, Professor Poggioli, your Boisran was quite a guy. Yes, Aristide Boisran was one of the greatest men I've ever known. For him to challenge the great voodoo took more than physical courage. If you don't mind my saying so, I think that we should have had him here instead of you. Now, why did you say it was your most famous case? I said it was the case that gave me my greatest reputation. You see, Mr. Wright, I'm not particularly interested in my reputation as a detective... But as a scientist... Well, now, just how did this case in which you were, well, forgive me, out Sean, how did it help you in your scientific pursuits? Well, because of it, I am now known throughout the length and breadth of the Caribbean as a great papalois. I, I have access to rites and ceremonies denied to white men. Opportunities may open for me to study and investigate one of the most fascinating of all civilizations. You see, Mr. Wright, I, I'm not a great detective, but I, I am a darn good scientist. <laughs> You have been listening to Murder Clinic. W.O.R. Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case. One member of the select band of the world's great detectives. detective was Professor Henry Poggioli, Ph.D. Professor Poggioli was played by Herbert Yost, and the part of Governor Boisron by Juan Hernandez. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. The tales on Murder Clinic are adapted by Lee Wright and John A. Bassett. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Robert Louis Cheon. Frank Knight speaking, this is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The call. But their exploits are unique. Each week at this time, WOR Mutual invites you to Murder Clinic where you'll meet one member of this select band in his most interesting case. The curtains part. In our amphitheater of mystery, all is dark save for one brilliant spotlight. And out of the shadows comes Max Caradoc. Oh, Mr. Carrados, look out, look out, sir. There's a step down there. May I help you? No, 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 no. I can get along perfectly. Don't bother, Mr. Knight. I can see in the dark. Oh, Mr. Carrados, I thought that you... you... You thought I was blind? Well, you're right. I am. But I manage pretty well, thank you. Yes, I see that you do. But tell me, don't you find your blindness an enormous handicap in your detective work? Oh, on the contrary. 
It prevents me from being deceived by the obvious. I must rely on my other senses, which are more reliable, I assure you. But, Mr. Carrados, I really don't... Ah, you admit it. And yet you have eyes. Well, I shall try to convince your ears, my friend. Uh, let me tell you the story of the Holloway Flat tragedy, in which those who had eyes saw nothing. <laughs> Called Louis Carlyle, my very good friend and associate. He was a private inquiry agent and often did me the honor of asking my help in some of his uh, more complex cases. One morning I dropped in at his office. Parkinson was with me, of course. He has been my personal attendant and my physical eyes for many years. Louis was a bit bewildered by a letter that had arrived in the morning mail. <laughs> What do you make of this letter, Max? It's certainly out of the ordinary run of my correspondence. Hmm. Good bond paper. Letterhead engraved. Albert Henry Polish. Uh, written by hand, I see. Let's see what he has to say, hmm? Important. See you alone. Absolute privacy. Will call 10 o'clock tomorrow morning. Signed A. H. Polish. Gad, Max, how do you do it? I, I've seen it a hundred times. I still can't believe it. <laughs> My dear Louis, why are things you can't see so mysterious to, to you? You wouldn't be surprised to watch me reading Braille, would you? Well, the ink on this paper is as clear as Braille to me. Uh, but to get back to this letter, your mysterious Mr. Polish says he's uh, coming this morning. Perhaps I'd better go. I uh... I wish you wouldn't, Max. But he says here, absolute privacy. Mm, yes. Uh, look, Max, I've an idea. Why don't you and Parkinson go into the next office and leave the door cracked just a bit so that you can listen in? This Polish affair might interest you. Yes? What is it? Uh, Mr. Polish to see you, Mr. Carlyle. Ah, uh, send him in in one minute. Yes, sir. He's here now. Please, Max. Oh, all right, Louis, if you wish it. Come on, Parkinson, let's go. Very well, sir. Pull the uh, door to, but not too close, uh, Parkinson, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, come in. Ah, that must be our friend Polish now. Mr. Carlyle? Yes? Are you alone? Why, yes, Mr. Polish, I am. Uh, I, I don't think he saw me come here, uh. I was careful. Oh, come, come, Mr. Polish. Control yourself. What was it you wished to see me about? Mr. Carlyle? Someone is trying to murder me. Well, well, Parkinson, this promises to be interesting. Why, dear Mr. Polish, surely you... I know it sounds impossible, but I tell you it's true. He's made one attempt in my life already. Who? Peter. Peter? Oh, I don't know his last name. He's a foreigner. He used to be engaged to the girl. The, uh, girl you wish to marry, Mr. No, Polish? no, nothing like that. I met it already. Oh, I see. It's not what you're thinking. There's nothing between us, really. But you see, well, my wife, she's a highly nervous woman, Mr. Carlyle. Insomnia and that sort of thing. As a matter of fact, we've had separate rooms for over a year now. Yeah, I understand. Well, when Mog, uh, this girl, found out I was married... Uh, there was a scene, I suppose. Yes, most unpleasant. But nothing compared to what happened when she told her boyfriend, Peter. She tried to murder me. Are you quite sure of that, Mr. Bullock? Let me tell you what happened. That night, uh, after the row, I mean, I couldn't sleep. I was jumpy. So I thought I'd go out for a bit and walk it off. Mm -hmm. So I got up, fixed a bolster and a pillow with my bathrobe over it in the bed, and then... Uh, went... Excuse me, uh, <clears throat> why did you do that? I told you, my wife's a highly nervous woman. Her insomnia. Oh, yes. If she came in and saw my bed empty, she'd be likely to get hysterics or something. I see. Go well, I, I fixed up this dummy in my bed and went out. I walked around maybe half an hour. When I got back and was coming up the stairs, we live in a block of flats. Yes. I came face to face with a man coming out. It was Peter. What did you do? I didn't do anything. When he saw me, he crowded back against the wall and gasped. Looked as though he'd seen a ghost. Before I could say a word, he dashed past me down the stairs and out of the house like a shot. And when I got up to my room... There with the booster in the bathroom I left in the bed, stabbed through and through with a knife. 
Somebody has driven a knife through what he thought was my body. Well, Mr. Porris, that's plain evidence of attempted murder. This, this is a police matter. Oh, no, no, that's just one I can't have. Think what it would mean. Visits, inquiries, cross-examinations, explanations. The whole thing would come out. My home would be broken up, my whole life ruined. But what can I do, Mr. Porris? What do you want? I can tell you what I don't want, Mr. Carlyle. I don't want to be murdered. And I don't want my wife to get wind of this in this affair. Well, Mr. Polish, I, I should advise you of going away for a while. It's impossible just now. My business... Well, then, be... until you can, I should advise new locks on all your doors and your windows. That means locksmiths and more questions. My wife's nervous. Oh, but... Surely, Mr. Polish, that's carrying consideration a bit far. Um, how did you account for the cut linen, the bolster? Oh, I've hidden them away in a drawer uh, until I can buy another sheet and cover. I managed to serve the bolster. Well, Mr. Polish, it's a unique problem. I, I don't see at the moment just how I can advise you. Come, Parkinson. This interview is practically over. Let's get out in, into the anteroom. I should like to see this foolhardy but devoted husband. Good day, Carlyle. It's been a great relief to me telling you about... I see there's, there's someone in the anteroom. Isn't there another way out? I don't want to be seen. It's quite all right, Mr. Polish. Mr. Carrados. He's blind. I'd like you to meet him. Blind, you say? Oh, well, all right. Oh, uh, Max, I'd like you to meet Mr. Polish. Oh, how do you do, Mr. Polish? Oh, uh, uh, yes, yes. Oh, pardon my glove, won't you? You see, I'm missing part of the finger in my right hand, and I'm uh, sensitive about oh, it. You needn't be, Mr. Polish. I, I found physical infirmities that have their compensations. Oh, uh, yes, sir. I can see that. Uh, well, I, I mean... I must be going, Mr. Carlyle. I'll get in touch with you if anything further develops. Oh, <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Polish. Goodbye, Mr. Polish. Goodbye. All right, Parkinson, you can come out from behind that screen. He's gone. Oh, come, come, Max. Why, why this elaborate device? Surely I could have told you what the fellow looks like. All <laughs> right, Louis, tell me, what does Mr. Polish look like? Why, Max, he's, um, medium height, average weight. He's, he's got, um, sort of brownish hair and... Uh, <laughs> I see, Louis. Medium, average, a perfect picture. And uh, what would you say, Parkinson? Uh, Mr. Polish is five foot nine, sir. He weighs in the neighborhood of 11 stone six. His hair is light brown, several shades lighter than his brows. He has a small mole beneath the left eye. The clothing of good material, but not custom made. Glove on right hand only. Kofskin, I should say. Oh, help enough, Parkinson, enough. Incidentally, you know, he's quite the most nervous chap I've ever met. Yes, I must have Polish seems absurd, obsessed with nerves. Very interesting. You, you must let me know how the sequel to this morning's prologue turns out. Now, uh, what I really came here to see you about, Louis, there's an auction of old Roman coins at Endicott next Monday... Uh, how about joining me for lunch at the club and going on to it afterwards, hmm? You You couldn't resist that, Max, could you? Well, neither can I. <laughs> All right, I'll be on hand. Next Monday it is. See you then. I hope this auction right, will be better. Murder, Listen, Louis. Wait, get your paper. Always flat murder. Read all that, Holloway flat. Isn't that the address of your remarkable caller murder, last Thursday? By Jove, Max, it is. Uh, what was the fellow's name? Uh, uh, Polish. I want... Here, boy. Boy. Give me a paper, please. Here you are, Governor. Thank you, sir. You're right, Max. It is Polish. Why, oh, the poor devil. Found dead in his bed this morning. Uh, unknown the room. A charwoman's gruesome discovery. Early this morning, they f shocking injury. Uh-huh. Hey, Gabby, Gabby. Scotland Yard.
Good afternoon, Inspector Beetle. Mm. Ah, Mr. Carrados. Um, this is my nephew, George, just promoted to the detective division. I see. I am very glad to know you, Mr. Carrados. My uncle, Inspector Beetle, he has been telling me a lot about you. Really? Uh, but now, Uncle, hadn't we better be getting along to Holloway Flat? Oh, so you're on the Polish case, Beetle. That's right. That's splendid. I think you'll be interested in what I have to tell you about this case. Um, we'll take a cab, and I'll give you the information as we drive along. And that's the yarn Polish told me, not four days ago. Well, a bit of luck, I should say, Mr. Carlyle. Looks as if we got our murderer before we even start. Polish didn't happen to give you the name and address of this young lady, did he? No, no, Beetle. He left something for you to find out. Well, that oughtn't to be hard, Uncle. Shop girl, kept company with a foreigner, name of Peter. Right. Well, here's the Polish flat now. Pull over, driver. I'm Inspector Beetle, Sergeant. Is this the Polish house? Yes, sir. I'll take over now. Is this Mrs. Polish? Yes. I'm Inspector Beetle, Mrs. Polish. Oh, won't you come in? These men are my associates. We'd like to see the body of your husband. Oh, it's unbelievable. Who could have done this terrible thing? My poor Albert. He was so good and so kind. When I got the wire, talky, I, I rushed right back. Oh, he wasn't at home when this happened, Mrs. Polish. Oh, no, no. Albert had insisted I go down to Torquay to my sisters for the weekend. Why did I go? If I'd only stayed, this never would have happened. Now, ma'am, you mustn't disturb yourself. You just leave everything to us. Oh, but I must be with him. My Albert. Oh, Albert. Stop her, Inspector. Don't let us see him. He's in a horrible state. Uh, Mrs. Polish, you'd better... Oh, Albert. Oh, confound it, Sergeant. Get her out of here. Oh, oh sir. Come on, Mrs. Polish. All right. Oh, Mrs. Polish. Lummy, he is a nasty sight. I've seen dead ones before, but this, his face is slashed like a fancy loaf. Yeah, it looks like there's been a wild beast at work. Horrible. Well, Inspector Beetle, it fits in with what we know, what he told me himself. Revenge and rage and sheer bloodthirstiness. Inspector. Yes, Mr. Carrados. Are you sure the corpse is Polish? Why, I uh, might have it for granted, Mr. Carrados. Why do you ask? I'm always suspicious of these murders where the victim's face is bashed beyond recognition, that's all. You're right, Max. He's fairly unrecognizable. Wait. Yes, yes, yes. It's Polish, all right. See here? A finger missing on the right hand. Remember, Max? He told us about that when he shook hands with you the other day in the office. Yes, I remember that very well. Nevertheless, Inspector, I'd compare our victim's fingerprints with those of Mr. Polish's, if I were you. Well, but Mr. Carrados, we haven't Polish's fingerprints on My the My dear man, there must be literally hundreds of them around this room. Everything he touched must be covered with them. Yeah, of course, sir. Stupid of me. George, attend to that. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, well, by the way, George, did you get the doctor's report? Uh, yes, I did, Uncle. He says it must have happened sometime between Saturday midnight and early Sunday morning. The neighbors saw him come home after taking Mr. Mrs. Polish to the station Saturday afternoon. And they saw the Sunday papers and milk bottle outside his door Sunday. He wasn't found till Mrs. Jones, the car woman, came to clean up this morning. So where was this uh, Mrs. Jones Saturday, George? She says Mrs. Polish let her go early Saturday, Mr. Carrados. What with her going away to Torquay for the weekend. I see. Poor chap, Mr. If only he'd taken my advice about changing those locks. Um, I say, Max, what are you doing there? Oh, I, I'm looking for that sheet and bolster he said he'd put in the bureau drawer after that first attempt on his life. Well, that's a good point, Mr. Carrados. Yeah, let George help you. Uh, socks, uh, shirt, pull over. And then let's try the next drawer, all right? Ah, here we are. This looks like them, all crumpled up in the corner. Good. He said he'd hidden them. Yes. Here's the knife cut. Oh, yeah. very, Mr. Carlyle, very interesting, but no more than we expected. Let's get on. Coming, Mr. Carrados? Uh, you go ahead. I'll join you in a moment in the living room. I'll just fold up this linen so it's tidy. Can you beat it? A blind man wanting things tidy as though he could see. I say, Uncle, take a look at this. 
Here's where that Peter fellow must have come in. Here's marks on the windowsill. Mm, you're right, George. Easy as ring of roses. There's the balcony and the stairway window, not a yard away. Oh, unusual case, Inspector Beadle. This murderer seems to have gone out of his way to make things easy for you. It fits, Max. It fits. Blind, jealous rage. And didn't have the wit to cover his tracks. Too bad Polish didn't take my advice about changing the locks on his door and windows. I mean, Yes? What is it, Constable? Sorry to disturb you, Inspector, but there's a chap out here with tools. Says he came to put in new locks. <laughs> That's locking the stable door, all right. Let's have him in. All right, you there. The Inspector wants to see you. Oh, how are you, Mr. Inspector? Blimey, what's this? Never mind that, my lad. You're a locksmith, eh? Right, Governor. My name, Joseph Biggs. We have a shop at Maidstone Crossing. Mr. Polish asked you to come here and do some work for him. That's right. Come in Friday, he did. Polite as you please. Asked me if I work Saturdays. Not as a rule, I says. Told me he needed his locks fixed. Never you mind Saturday closing, he says. Monday will do. And now here I comes. One hour in the bus from my shop. It's hard lines, that's what it is, it's hard lines. That'll do, that'll do. We'll just get along with you now. Blimey, I'm called to do a job and then get bounced out of it. Oh, that's that. Hmm. Just one more thing. Sergeant, did you ask Mrs. Jones whether there'd been a fire in this grate recently? Yes, sir. Said there hadn't been one for weeks. I see. Then these ashes may be significant. Here, have a look, George. It looks like some paper's been burned. Not much left. Hey, what's this? Look, it's a bit of newspaper. Oh, good boy. Let's Funny have a kind look. of printing. Why, it's Italian. Just one more sign pointing in the same direction. Peter. Yes, isn't it, Inspector Beadle? Did anyone happen to notice if he had written C. Parler Italiano in red on the wall over the bed? Why, no, Mr. Carados. I'll go look. <laughs> no, no, George, don't bother. When you know Mr. Carrados as well as I do, you you will understand that although there's always something in what he says, it's not always what you think it is. That's right, Mr. Carrados. Just why do you think the murderer might have written Italian spoken on the bed? Well, obviously, Inspector, to make sure you wouldn't miss it. Oh, you're right, Mr. Carrados. This P Peter has been pretty helpful. Nothing to the case, just a simple routine job of finding the shop girl and her Italian boyfriend. Bulldog you are, Inspector. <clears throat> but, but I wonder, uh, while you're pursuing this uh, simple routine job, uh, would you do a favor for me? Why, of course, Mr. Carrados, anything you like, if, it'll, if you think it'll help find the murderer. Thanks, Inspector. Now, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> This is Max Carrados. Oh, George, any news? Well, sir, we followed our party as you ordered. Uh, he left the house in the afternoon, took a bus to Kensington, stayed there in the park two hours, taking a walk, then went right back and hasn't stirred since. Didn't talk to anybody? Make any phone calls? No, sir, nothing. I see. Any other news? Just that we checked the fingerprints. It was Polish, all right. And Peter? No, sir, no report on Peter yet. But we are hopeful. Good chap. Well, keep on with it, George. Nothing, sir. No sign of Peter. Nothing. Except one thing. Hmm? There are three locksmiths in the vicinity. Excellent. Uh, but don't get discouraged, George. Keep at it. No, sir. Nothing. Now, Mr. Carrados, shall we keep at it? By all means, George. It's absolutely vital. Absolutely. Hello? Mr. Carrados? Yes? You are right, sir. Absolutely right. Ah. They're together now at the Picos Club. I'm phoning from a booth in the ante room. Don't let them out of your sight. No, sir, I won't. Be sure to stay there. Right, sir. I'll do that. Parkinson? Parkinson? Yes, sir? Parkinson, phone Mr. Carlyle and Inspector Beadle. Tell them to meet us in half an hour, then call a cab. 
Yes, sir. But pardon me, sir, but just where shall I tell them to meet us? <laughs> of course, Parkinson, good man. I, I must be more excited than I thought. Uh, tell them to meet us in the lobby of the Picos Club. And tell them to be sure to wait in the lobby for me. Ah, Louis, you got here before me. Hello, Mac. And Inspector Beadle. Mr. Carrados? Uh, Mr. Carrados, you called it to a turn. How you ever guessed it? Now, now, no time for that now, George. Is that inside? Yes, sir. At that table there, sir. Where I'm pointing, see? Oh, Oh, I'm sorry, sir. I, I, I clean forgot that I'm blind. Never mind, George. That's the finest compliment you could have paid me. Now, what's happened so far? Well, as soon as we had them spotted, I talked to the manager. There was a little trouble, but Uncle fixed that as soon as he got here. One of our own men took over the waiter's job at their table. Oh, they seemed careful when he was around. Uh, just one thing he caught, though. Hmm? When our man came up, she was saying something about... There might even be a raid here to look for Peter the Italian. And then they both laughed. Yes, uh, they would laugh. I'm going in there alone. Ah, we can't hear to that, Mr. Carrados. It's too big a risk. The man has a gun on him. We spotted that. These people are desperate. Dangerous, it would be. Don't worry, Inspector. Believe me, I'll be safe. Just one thing. Keep your eyes on me. When I unloosen my scarf, throw that master switch in the fuse box. Turn out every light in the place. It's important. But, Mr. Carrados, I, I won't hear of it. I... I... Blast it. He's in there already. Oh, we'd better get to the theatre. We'll be late. Do finish your... There's no hurry. We've plenty of time. Oh, do finish your coffee, Dick. I'm nervous here. I still think it was a crazy stunt. Don't worry. It... It's over a month now, and nothing... Why, good evening, good evening. Why, how pleasant to meet you again, Mr. Polish. Why, well, what do you mean? Who... But of course, how stupid of me. I couldn't expect you to remember me, Mr. Polish. After all, we met only once. There must be some mistake. I never... Surely, met... Mr. Polish, you recall your visit to Mr. Carlyle's office. As you were leaving, I was sitting in the anteroom. I've told you there must be some mistake. My name is not Polish. But of course... Of course, how stupid of me. Oh, you must forgive me. You couldn't be Polish, could you? I remember now. I read somewhere the poor fellow was murdered, wasn't oh. he? Was he? Yes, terrible thing. But what an embarrassing mistake. You know, it's only the second time in my life it's happened to me. Uh, mistaking a voice, I mean. You, you see, I'm blind. Oh. Yes, miss, quite blind. Oh. And I've always prided myself on never forgetting a voice. And now here I am, forgetting the first... <laughs> You've made your second mistake. So if you'll excuse me... Yes, it's all coming back to me now. How could I have forgotten? Why, only the other day Mr. Carlyle was telling me about that dreadful murder case. Uh. The police let him in on the little game they're playing. What little game? What do you mean? Well, uh, I shouldn't tell you. It's in the strictest confidence, of course. But you've been so kind. Yes, yes. What little game? Why... This Peter, the Peter after the laughter, the Italian. You mean they found him? Found him. That's just it. The police know there's no such person. Ridiculous. Why, all the evidence in the newspaper... All point. planted, every bit of it. <laughs> Imagine that. Why, they even know who did do it. You see, the police have discovered that the man who called on Carlyle that day wasn't Mr. Polish at all. He was the wife's lover. Mrs. Polish, I mean... That's very interesting. <laughs> yes, isn't it? You see, Polish's wife and her lover had planned to murder Polish all along. So he, the lover, I mean, went to Carlyle's as Polish and spun a yarn about some non-existent Italian who had already tried to kill him. <laughs> Wasn't that clever of them? <laughs> to supply the police with a murder they never could find. <laughs> Why are you telling me all this? Well, uh, I thought since I mistook you for Polish and all that, you, you might be interested. But if I'm boring you... No, well, no. Go on. Well, of course, it, it must have been the wife who planned the whole thing. She wanted the lover and her husband's money, both. Oh. The police know that, but they can't do a thing about it. That is, uh, till they find the lover. Of course, if they once find him, it's simple. They'll both hang. Unless the lover turns King's evidence. Uh, that'll save his life, of course. It would. Are you sure of that? Oh, absolutely. Dick, what are you thinking? But uh, on the other hand, if they never find him, she stays. Phew. <laughs> it's warm in here, isn't it? I, I must loosen this scarf. 
Max, are you all right? Mr. Carrados, what happened? As you see, Inspector, Mrs. Polish has just shot and killed her partner in crime. You know dead men tell no tales. If I hadn't prevented it by catching her wrist, we'd have found the gun in his hand and the verdict might have been suicide. Who is the for young lady, are, Mrs. Polish? You devil, you! I could kill you! No, 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 my dear lady, you mean you would kill me. The two are not synonymous. <laughs> Well, Mr. Carrados, that was a very pretty trap. A bit elaborate, perhaps, but pretty. E elaborate? Yes, rather. Uh, weren't you taking a chance personally and turning out the lights that way? Oh, you forget, Mr. Knight. In the dark, it is I who can see. I who have the advantage. Without lights, they were playing in my backyard. Yes, I can see how your blindness helped you there. But tell me this. How did you get onto them in the first place? I got my first clue to the truth because I didn't trust my eyes, having no eyes to trust. Uh, you remember when we found that sheet and bolster case so beautifully hidden for us to mm -hmm. find, with the knife thrust in just the right place to bear out the story Louis heard? Yes, yes, but Beadle and Carlyle and George, they saw them too. Exactly. They saw them. <laughs> but I, I smelled them. They were perfumed, my friend. They had been taken from her bed, not his. A small mistake, but a fatal one. You have been listening to Murder Clinic. W.O.R. Mutual Series, which brings you each week one exciting case, one member from the select band of the world's great detectives. Tonight's detective was Mr. Max Carrados and was played by Alfred Shirley. Louis Carlyle was played by Horace Braille. Original music was composed by Ralph Barnhart and conducted by Bob Stanley. The tales told on Murder Clinic are adapted by authors Lee Wright and John A. Baffert. Murder Clinic is produced under the direction of Alvin Flanagan. This is Frank Knight speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.